Number seven, the Ketty Cabin Murders. Sue Sharp and her five children moved into Cabin 28 at the Ketty Resort in Sierra Nevada, California in early 1981. By the time April rolled around, the family had been there for two months and they had been enjoying themselves. That was until April 12th when Sue's 14-year-old daughter returned to Cabin 28 after spending the night at a neighboring cabin. Upon entering the cabin, the young Sharp found her mother Sue, her 15-year-old brother John, and his 17-year-old friend Dana Wingate all bound and gagged. They had been beaten and stabbed to death. Thankfully, the three youngest Sharp children and one of their friends were found unharmed and asleep in another room. However, one person was missing from the cabin, and that was 13-year-old Tina Sharp. Her disappearance would stay a mystery over the next three years until her skull was found a short distance away from Cabin 28. It became obvious that Tina had died around the same time as her mother and brother. The whereabouts of the rest of her body remain a mystery. Police have never had a suspect in the Ketty Cabin murders, but they believe there were probably two killers. They believe that the killers came back to the cabin with John Sharp and Dana Wingate, where they were spotted by neighbors who gave the details for the official police sketch, which is shown here. Police are still looking for information about the killers, and without it, the four murders in Cabin 28 will likely never be solved. Number 6. The Vasilla Axe Murders In June of 1912, the city council of the small town of Vasilla, Iowa, was having a disagreement with the electric company. This led to the power company turning off all electricity to the town on the night of June 9th. It was sometime during that hydroless night that someone broke into the Moore house and murdered Josiah and Sarah Moore, their four children who ranged in age from 5 to 11, and two other girls ages 8 and 12 who were visiting the Moore household on that fateful night. All of them had been murdered in their sleep, the killer had taken an axe and whacked all his victims in the head multiple times. There were a handful of suspects in the case. One of them included Iowa State Senator Frank F. Jones, who was angry with Josiah Moore over a business deal. Some people believe the senator paid a man named William Mansfield to commit the murders. Mansfield was a pretty nasty guy. He is suspected of murdering another family with an axe four days prior in Paola, Kansas. Mansfield also murdered his wife, his child, his mother-in-law, and his father-in-law, again with an axe. Another suspect was serial killer Henry Lee Moore, who was active in the area at the time. Moore, who is not related to the victims, is believed to have killed at least 25 people, and he also liked to use an axe. A third suspect was Reverend George Jacklin Kelly, who was a traveling preacher in the area at the time of the murders. He was even charged with the murders, but ultimately he was acquitted. While the case may never be solved, the house in Vasilla is now a tourist attraction. Number 5. The Aurora Hammerslayer Sometime between midnight and 6 a.m. on January 16, 1984, a man broke into the Bennett home in Aurora, Colorado. 27-year-old Bruce Bennett became aware that someone was in the house, and he fought with the man on several different floors of his house and the stairway. Sadly, this wasn't a fight Bruce Bennett would win. He was found beaten with what police believe was a hammer, and his throat was slit. After murdering Bruce, the killer attacked his 26-year-old wife, Deborah, and his two daughters, 7-year-old Melissa and 3-year-old Vanessa. Both Deborah and Melissa were sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death. Vanessa was also beaten severely with a hammer, but survived the deadly home invasion. Sadly, this massacre wasn't the only home invasion committed by the unknown suspect. On January 4th, 1984, they believed the killer broke into the home of James and Kimberly Hobbinchild and beat the couple into a coma with a hammer. Luckily, they survived the attack. Then, on January 10th, two women were beaten with a hammer in two separate attacks in their homes. Donna Dixon was put into a coma but survived. 50-year-old Patricia Louise wasn't as lucky and she was killed in the attack. Currently, there is a John Doe warrant out for the suspect. A John Doe warrant is issued when the police know who committed the murders because of evidence like DNA, but they do not know the identity of the person. Using the DNA that was pulled from the crime scenes, a forensic artist was able to draw a sketch of how the man may look when he committed the crimes and an age progression photo to show what he may look like now. Police are still looking for information and hope that one day this case will be solved. Number 4. The Kinterhayfack Murders 63-year-old Andreas Gruber lived on a farm called Hinterkaifeck in Germany with his 72-year-old wife, 35-year-old widowed daughter, and her two children, who were 2 and 7. On March 31, 1922, a maid, Maria Baumgartner, started working on the farm. 
Within a day of the new maid's arrival, the Gruber family stopped appearing in public. On April 4th, their neighbors began to suspect something was wrong, so they went to investigate the farm and they found the barn door locked. They broke in and found four bodies, Andreas Gruber, his wife, his daughter, and his seven-year-old granddaughter. In the farmhouse, they found the bodies of the maid and the two-year-old. They all had been killed with a pickaxe. Authorities believe that the four family members found in the barn were lured there one at a time and then murdered. The murderer then moved inside and killed the toddler and the maid. It is also believed that the killer stayed at the farm for a few days after the murders, in which the killer fed the farm animals, milked the cows, and ate the Gruber's food. What is really strange about the murders is that Andreas Gruber had reported strange occurrences happening at the farm in the months leading up to the murders. In fact, the reason Maria Baumgartner came to live at the farm was because the last maid had quit because she believed the farm was haunted. There are a number of theories as to who killed the Gruber family and their maid, but the case remains cold and it is unlikely that it will ever be solved. Number 3. The Yogurt Shop Murders On the night of December 6, 1991, in Austin, Texas, a police officer discovered that an I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop was on fire. He called the fire department who arrived a short time later and put out the fire. Inside the shop, they found the bodies of 13-year-old Amy Ayers and 15-year-old Sarah Harbison who were visiting the store. They also found the bodies of Sarah's sister, Jennifer Harbison, along with Eliza Thomas, both who were 17 years old and worked at the store. They were all stripped and then their clothes were used to bind their hands and their legs. At least two of them had been raped and all four girls had been shot in the head. Three of the bodies were stacked together in the storage room, but Amy's body was found in an adjacent room. The fire had been set to cover the crime and for the most part it worked. What evidence the fire didn't destroy was contaminated by the sprinkler system and the fire department. The only piece of physical evidence investigators were able to pull from the scene was DNA from the two girls who had been raped. Over the next few years, police took DNA samples from over 100 men, but no match was ever found. In 1999, cold case investigators were looking into the massacre and detectives started looking into a man named Maurice Pierce. On the night of the murder, Pierce was 16 years old and he had been arrested for carrying a gun not too far from the yogurt shop. However, the caliber of his gun didn't match the gun that had been used in the murders and he was dismissed as a suspect back in 1991. They also interrogated one of Pierce's friends, Michael Scott, for over 20 hours. It concluded with Scott's confession to the murders, saying that he, Pierce, and two other men named Robert Springsteen and Forrest Weber had committed the rapes and murders. All four men were arrested and once in custody, Springsteen also confessed to the murders. The problem was that the DNA pulled off the girls did not match any of the four men. As a result, only Springsteen and Scott went to trial for the murders because they had confessed. They were convicted in 2000, but in 2009 their convictions were overturned because it was proved that the police had coerced their confessions. The police believe the two men are guilty and believe the DNA belongs to a fifth man who was involved with the crime, which would explain why the DNA doesn't match any of the four suspects. Others believe that the police have tunnel vision for the men and say that Springsteen and Scott were innocent men who spent nine years in prison while the real killers remained free. Number 2. The Oklahoma Girl Scout Murders June 12, 1977 was the first day of Girl Scout camp at Camp Scott in Oklahoma for 8-year-old Lori Farmer, 9-year-old Michelle Gus, and 10-year-old Doris Milner. During the evening, there was a thunderstorm that forced the girls into their tent for the night. The next morning, a counselor went to get the girls from their tent but found they were missing. Sadly, their bodies were found a short distance away. They had been raped, beaten, and strangled, and then their bodies were stuffed into their sleeping bags. There was one main suspect, and that was Jean Leroy Hart, who was a convicted rapist that had escaped from prison four years prior to the murders and was on the lam when the murders were committed. Hart had grown up around the camp, and police believe he was in the area at the time of the murders. He was even charged with the murders, but was acquitted in March 1979. Hart was in prison for unrelated charges when he died of a heart attack a short time after his acquittal, and no one else has ever been charged in connection with the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. Number 1. The Arlino Family Massacre 25-year-old Manuel Arlino, his 25-year-old wife Monica, their three children, 5-year-old Manuel Jr., 2-year-old Leticia, and 15-month-old Eduardo, along with Manuel's sister, 
19-year-old Rosa y Lila, were driving from their home in Vela del Fuente, Mexico, to San Angelo, which is just inside the Texas border. At some point, the family got a flat tire, and Manuel fixed it, but then a short distance later, they got another flat. That is when a blonde-haired man with a cowboy hat driving a pickup truck stopped to help them. He offered to drive them the 30 miles to Sonoma, and then back to their car with their fixed tire. Sadly, the mysterious stranger wasn't there to help them at all. The next morning, the bodies of the six members of the Arlino family were found scattered along a mile stretch of highway about eight miles from their car that still had a flat tire. They all had been shot and stabbed and the women had been raped. Sadly, only five-year-old Manuel survived the massacre. In 2006, after an anonymous tip came in, police thought they were closer to identifying a suspect, but no arrests have ever been made and the identity of the blonde cowboy remains a mystery. Number 5. The Lane Bryant Shooting On the morning of February 2, 2008, a man armed with a gun walked into the Lane Bryant Outlet Store in Tinsley Park, Illinois, and he ordered the four customers and the two employees to go to the back of the store. Once there, he tied them all up, but the store's manager was able to use a cell phone to call 911. When the police arrived at the store, they found all six women, who ranged in age from 22 to 42, had been shot. Only one woman survived the slaughter. She described the killer as an African-American man around 6 foot to 6 foot 2 with a husky build and his hair was in cornrows. The identity of the shooter is still a mystery and there is a reward of $100,000 for information on the killer. Number 4. The Miyazagua Family Massacre On the night of December 30, 2000, someone or a group of people broke into the home of the Miyazaguas in the Setagawa Ward of Japan. When he, or they, broke into the house, they found 41-year-old Yazuko home with her 8-year-old daughter, Nina, and 6-year-old son, Ray. The home invader, or invaders, stabbed both mother and daughter to death while Ray was killed via strangulation. The killer, or killers, then waited for 44-year-old Makiko to come home from work at 11 p.m. He was stabbed shortly after walking in the door. After killing the family, the killer, or killers, stayed in the house for the next 11 hours. During that time, he, or they, used the internet twice and ate the family's ice cream. The bodies of the family were found the next morning. Inside the house, the police found plenty of evidence, like a shirt that was worn by someone who did the stabbing, and blood that didn't belong to the family. We've also mentioned a few times that it is possible that multiple people were responsible for the massacre. Evidence that points to multiple suspects is that on the morning after the murders, a cab driver picked up three young men not far from the crime scene and they left bloodstains in his cab. Despite all the evidence, the person or people responsible for the quadruple murder is still a mystery. Number 3. The Alaskan Fishing Boat Murders In September 1982, the fishing boat, The Investor, was found in a cove outside of Craig, Alaska, and it was engulfed in flames. The fire was put out, and on the boat, the police found eight charred bodies. The bodies belonged to Mark Colhurst, his pregnant wife Irene, their children, four-year-old John and Kimberly, who was five, and four crew members who were all teenagers. All of them had been shot, and then the fire was set to cover up the murders. Only one person was charged in connection with the mass murder, and that was a man named John Kenneth Peel. He was seen in the area where the boat had been anchored and near the cove where the burning boat was discovered, but he was acquitted twice. Without any other suspects, the murder of the eight people aboard the Investor remains cold. Number 2. The Jean Sorel Center Fire On the night of May 24, 1982, the students slash patients at the Jean Sorel Center in France, which was a psychiatric hospital for youths, watched a television show called Should Psychiatric Hospitals Be Burned? Later that night, one of the patients, who was between 14 and 20, decided that their hospital needed to be burned down. The fire spread quickly and it burned for four hours before the fire department got it under control. In total, 22 people were killed, 20 of them were students, and the other two were female employees. Out of the 70 surviving students, investigators were not able to determine who set the deadly blaze. Number 1. The Frog Boys March 26, 1991 was a national holiday in South Korea, so a group of five boys, who range in age from 9 to 13, decided to go catch frogs at Mount Waryong, which was not far from their homes. 
When none of them returned later that day, a massive search was launched, and over the weeks, 300,000 police and military staff looked for the boys, but no trace of them could be found. Their skeletal remains wouldn't be found until 11 years later, after some heavy rainfall, their shallow graves were exposed. They were buried just over a mile away from their homes. All five boys had been buried side by side with their shoes beside them. The pathologist who examined the bones found marks on three of the boys' skulls, and he concluded that the boys were stabbed in the head with a sharp object, like a pick or a chisel point hammer. The police have never publicly identified a suspect, and the murder of the Frog Boys is one of South Korea's most notorious unsolved mysteries. Number 3. The Trozomovs On December 15, 2012, the police in Kharkiv, Ukraine, were called to the apartment where the Trobmanov family lived. Vladimir Trobmanov was 59 years old and he was a judge. When the police arrived at the apartment, they found a brutal crime scene. Vladimir, along with his 59-year-old wife, Irina, their 30-year-old son, Sergei, and Sergei's girlfriend, 29-year-old Marina Zovea, were all dead. They weren't just dead, they had been decapitated and their heads were missing. The medical examiner said that Vladimir, Irina, and Zovea were beheaded after they were dead. Sergei, on the other hand, was decapitated while he was still alive. Evidence at the crime scene indicated that there was at least two people who were involved in the four murders. The police think that the murders were planned for some time. The police found no signs of a break-in, and the neighbors didn't hear or see anything unusual. The police have three main theories about why the family was killed. The first is that it was a robbery. Vladimir was internationally known for his rare coin collection. He also had impressive collections of ceramic figures, medals, and antique furniture. A few items from these collections were missing. The second theory stems from the fact that Vladimir was a judge. He may have been killed in retaliation for a case that he ruled on during his 30 years on the bench. The third theory is that the murders were symbolic. At the time of the murders, Ukrainians were unhappy with their justice system. It was a Soviet-style justice system, and 90% of all cases ended with a guilty verdict. The judge and his family were beheaded on a day in the Ukraine that specifically honors judges. If the crime was a political statement, no one has claimed responsibility for it. No one has ever been arrested in connection with the murders of the judge and his family. The heads of the four victims have never been found. Number 2. Tammy Cooper and the Allens In the spring of 2004, Tammy Cooper moved with her three children, 11-year-old Mahogany Jasmine Allen and her twin sons, 9-year-old Kadice and Kashim Allen, from Dallas to Lubbock, Texas. On the morning of October 25th, which was about six months after the family moved to the city, a friend of the family walked into their four-bedroom apartment and made a horrifying discovery. Cooper and her children were dead. Detectives arrived on the scene, and they said that walking into the apartment was like walking into a nightmare. All four family members had been beaten, slashed, and stabbed. There is evidence that Cooper tried to stop the attack on the children. There is also evidence that the children tried to escape. The police interviewed friends and family of Cooper, and learned that at 10.15 on the night of the murders, Cooper was talking to a friend on the phone. The friend said she heard a door open, and then she heard a deep man's voice. The friend assumed that one of the children let the man into the apartment. The man told Cooper to hang up the phone because they had to talk. Cooper asked the man something to the effect of, How did you find me? Cooper's friend asked who her visitor was. Cooper said, You don't know him. He isn't from here. His name is Butch, and he is black. Cooper then ended the call. The friend said that Cooper sounded calm, and she didn't indicate that anything was wrong. 
15 minutes later, another friend called, and her call went straight to voicemail. Cooper's family thinks that she was being killed, or she was already dead when the second call was made. The police said that Butch is a person of interest, but they don't know who he is. The police aren't sure what Cooper meant when she said he wasn't from around there. She could have meant that he didn't live in the apartment complex, the neighborhood, or even the city. Since Cooper knew Butch's name, and she didn't scream or ask for help while talking on the phone with her friend, the police think that they had some type of personal relationship. Beyond that, the only things that the police possibly know about Butch is what Cooper told her friend, which is that he is a black man with a deep voice. The police say it feels like they are moving towards solving the case, but at the time of this video, no arrests have been made in the murders of Tammy Cooper and her three children. Number 1. The Beckers In early 1979, Howard Becker retired from his job as a physicist at General Electric. Howard was 61 years old, and he lived on a 16-acre wooded estate in Louisville, Kentucky with his wife, 57-year-old Helen, and his son, 25-year-old David, who worked as an electrical engineer at Louisville Gas and Electric. At 7.17 p.m. on June 25th, David called 911. He calmly told the dispatcher that he came home and found his parents and his niece, nine-year-old Erica Elizabeth, who was visiting, dead inside the house. The police arrived on the scene and they found all three family members shot to death. Besides the level of violence, what shocked the police was the way that David acted. He was emotionless, almost indifferent, despite finding his parents and his niece brutally murdered. The police brought David in for questioning, and five hours later, the lead detective said that David confessed to the murders. The detective said that David said that he was at his riding club, and then he came home and found Erica there. He started to sexually assault her, and his mother caught him. The detective said that David picked up a rifle and shot his mother in the face. He then shot his father with the rifle. The detective said that David didn't remember shooting Erica, but he said he must have done it. David also admitted to some rather unusual things. For example, he was 25 years old and he was a virgin, and he had tried to have sex with a family cat. He also inappropriately touched Erica once, when she was six months old. After his confession, David was arrested. The day after the triple homicide, the police thought they had a pretty good case against David. He had confessed and given them a motive for the murders. They also thought that the confession matched the evidence and the state of the crime scene. Notably, Erica's body had signs of sexual abuse. Nothing had been stolen from the home, so robbery didn't seem to be the motive, and that suggests that the killer may not have been a stranger. Also, David had been having arguments with his parents before they were killed. David wanted to be a veterinarian, and his parents didn't like the idea. Then, very quickly, the police's case fell apart. They discovered that two guns were used in the murder, a rifle that was found at the home, and a pistol that wasn't found. Howard and Erica had been shot with both guns, while Helen had only been shot with the pistol. In his supposed confession, David didn't mention the second gun. David also refused to sign the confession or have his confession recorded. In fact, he denied making the confession. Despite these problems with the case, David went to trial in February 1980. His sisters, including Erica's mother, supported his claims of innocence and paid for his defense team. During the trial, David's lawyer showed that he didn't have enough time to commit the murders. When the police arrived at the home, they found food cooking on the stove and burnt french fries in the oven. The defense team surmised that the family was attacked while dinner was being cooked. Otherwise, the fries wouldn't have burned. 
The defense team had lab tests done on the fries and the stove, and they found it would have taken 60 to 80 minutes to burn the fries that way. This suggests that Howard, Helen, and Erica were killed at least 15 minutes before David called 911 at 7.17. According to an eyewitness, David left the riding club sometime between 6.45 and 6.48 p.m. His home was about 20 miles from the riding club. He said that he made one stop on the way home and that was to buy peanut oil from a store. A bottle of peanut oil was found in his vehicle and it was the only kind and size that was sold in the store. David also said that he saw a police officer at a crash site on his way home. An officer testified that he was at a crash site in the area that David mentioned between 6.58 and 7.03 p.m. David then called the police at 7.17. The defense argued that if David did stop for the peanut oil, and based on when and where he saw the police officer, he would have arrived home two minutes before calling 911. Besides arguing that David didn't have enough time to commit the murders and dispose of the pistol, which was never found, they also pointed out that there was no physical evidence tying him to the triple murder. David was ultimately found not guilty on all counts. After his acquittal, he went to veterinarian school and he worked as a vet and a horse trainer for many years. In the 2000s, David had sexual reassignment surgery, and her name is now Kathleen Ann Becker. She said that she never got angry with the police for charging her with murder. She said, as the only survivor who lived at the house, she was the most obvious suspect. The one question that still lingers is who killed Howard and Helen Becker and their granddaughter, Erica Elizabeth. No one else has been arrested in connection with the triple murder. It's believed that since two guns were used, that there were probably two killers. Sadly, their identity is a mystery to this day. Number 3. Antoinette Frank In the fall of 1994, 24-year-old Antoinette Frank was a rookie on the New Orleans Police Department. On the night of November 15th, she responded to the report of a shooting. One of the victims was 18-year-old Rogers Lacaze. Lacaze was a drug dealer and he and a friend were shot by one of his customers. Both Lacaze and his friend survived the shooting. As Lacaze recovered in the hospital, Antoinette paid him visits. After he got out of the hospital, Antoinette bought him a cell phone, expensive clothes, and she even rented him a Cadillac. She also let him ride around in her squad car while she was on duty. She even let him drive the police car on a few occasions. When Antoinette introduced Lacaze to other people, she said that he was her trainee. Besides working for the police department, Antoinette also picked up extra money filling in shifts, working security at the Kim On restaurant which was a family-owned Vietnamese restaurant in East New Orleans. Antoinette didn't work too often as a security guard because the person who oversaw security at the restaurant, another officer with the New Orleans Police Department named Ronald Williams, didn't trust her. He usually only called her in if he was desperate. On the night of March 4, 1995, Antoinette and Lacaze came into the restaurant twice to get food. At around 1.50 a.m., the restaurant closed. Inside the restaurant were Ronald Williams, who was working security, four of the restaurant's owner's children, Chow, Kwok, Kong, and Havu, and another restaurant employee named Vui. Just after the restaurant closed, Antoinette came to the door of the restaurant and tried to open it, but it was locked. Chow Vu had a bad feeling, so she collected all the money in the restaurant and hid it in a microwave. Williams wasn't too worried about Antoinette getting into the restaurant because the door was locked. He was surprised when Antoinette pulled out a set of keys and let herself into the restaurant. 
and said keys when missing earlier in the evening, but no one had realized that Antoinette had stolen them on one of her earlier visits to the restaurant. Once Antoinette was in the restaurant, she started yelling and pushed Chow, Kwok, and Vui into the back of the restaurant. While they were in the back, they heard a gunshot and Antoinette ran to the front of the restaurant. What they heard was Lacaz shooting Officer Williams. As the married father of two laid on the ground, Antoinette stood over him and fired several more rounds into him. When Antoinette left the back of the restaurant to kill her fellow officer, Chow, Kwok, and Vui hid in the restaurant's freezer. While in the freezer, they watched through a window in the freezer's door as Antoinette and Lacaz searched for the money. After Antoinette found the money in the microwave, she shot 17-year-old Kong and 24-year-old Ha as they kneeled on the floor. When the shooting stopped and everything was quiet, Kwok opened the door of the freezer. He didn't see Antoinette or Lacaz, so he ran out of the freezer. As he ran through the restaurant, he passed the dead bodies of his brother and sister. He ran to a friend's home and called 911. The police arrived at the restaurant shortly afterward, and Antoinette, who was off duty and out of uniform, showed up at the restaurant as well. When Chow saw that the police had arrived, she ran outside and was startled to see Antoinette there. Antoinette went up to Chow and she asked her what happened. Chow got away from Antoinette and told another officer that Antoinette was the one who performed the robbery. Antoinette was arrested and they found a gun in the waistband of her pants. They concluded that after stealing the money, Antoinette drove Lacaz home and that she was going to come back to the restaurant to kill the other witnesses. She was surprised to find that her fellow officers had already arrived on scene. Lacaz was arrested at his apartment. Antoinette and Lacaz were both convicted of the three murders and they were sentenced to death. In November 1995, a month after Antoinette was sentenced to death, her house was searched. Some human bones were found buried beneath it. The bones belonged to a man and the skull had a bullet wound. The bones weren't identified, but it's believed that they belonged to her father. Antoinette had reported her father missing a year and a half before the mass murder at the restaurant. Since Antoinette was already sitting on death row, not much effort was put into identifying the bones, but it's believed that the remains belonged to her father. Antoinette Frank is still on death row, and currently, she is the only woman on death row in Louisiana. Her execution date was last set for December 2008, but it was cancelled, and a new execution date has yet to be set. The cause has been appealing his convictions. He claims that he is innocent and he wasn't involved in the robbery. He says that at the time of the shooting, he was at a pool hall. His lawyer says someone else, quite possibly Antoinette's brother, Adam Frank, was really Antoinette's accomplice in the shooting. Adam Frank has always denied being involved in the deadly robbery and no evidence ties him to the crime scene. In October 2017, it was announced that the Louisiana Supreme Court would hear Lacaz's case. He was granted a retrial shortly afterward. But then a month later, that decision was reversed and the retrial was denied. His sentence has since been changed from a death sentence to a life sentence. Today, Rogers Lacaz sits in prison maintaining his innocence. Number 2. Tor Hedin On the night of November 28, 1951, the police were called to a house fire in Shornay, Sweden. Local police officer, 24-year-old Tor Hedin, was one of the first officers to arrive at the crime scene. The home belonged to a 32-year-old miller 
named John Allen Nielsen. He was found inside the burned out house with an axe buried in his chest. The killer then splashed gasoline on the body and around the house and then he struck a match as he walked out. Nielsen was killed after hosting a poker game and the money was missing so robbery was the most likely motive. Hedina never worked on a murder case before but he vowed to bring the killer to justice. Several times Hedina answered questions from the media about the case. This photograph which was taken by a photographer with a local newspaper, shows Hedin taking notes at the crime scene. An eyewitness said that they saw a man wearing some type of uniform riding a bike near the crime scene just before the fire started. Hundreds of people who lived in the area and wore uniforms, like rail and postal employees, were interviewed. When the interviews didn't turn up any leads, Hedin asked a psychic for help, but nothing he did led to the killer being identified. People living in the area had no idea that the person who hacked to death Nielsen was the very person who was investigating the murder, Tor Hedin. The murder of Nielsen wasn't his first serious crime. When Hedin was 16, he broke into a brewery to steal some oats. To hide the evidence of the robbery, he set the brewery on fire. While investigating the murder of Nielsen, Hedin got engaged to Eula Osberry. But in July of 1952, just a few months into the engagement, Osberry broke it off. She had come to fear Hedin because he was physically abusive. On August 20th, Hedin went to the nursing home where Osberry worked to exchange some personal belongings. At first, they talked pleasantly, but then Hedin snapped. He started yelling at her, so she started yelling back. He then tried to get her to be quiet by stuffing his gloves and then a handkerchief in her mouth. This only made Osprey angrier, so Hedin pulled out a pair of handcuffs and locked them on her wrists. When she was handcuffed, Osbury threatened to kill her. Hedin spent the night with Osbury in one of the employee bedrooms in the nursing home. Osbury remained handcuffed all night. In the morning, one of her co-workers reported the incident to a doctor who in turn contacted one of Hedin's superiors on the police force. Hedin was fired immediately. That night, just before midnight, Hedin drove to his parents' home in Stora Haria. He entered their home as they slept. Using an axe, he hacked them to death and then set the house on fire. He then drove to the nursing home where Osbury was working an overnight shift. He managed to get inside the nursing home and he found his 24-year-old ex-fiance sleeping in a room with her boss 55-year-old Agnes Lunden. He hacked both women to death with his axe. After both women were dead, just like he did at every other one of his crime scenes, Hedin started a fire. Unfortunately, this time, there were people still alive at the crime scene, 17 elderly people in all. Three women and one man died in the fire, and another woman died five days later because of injuries she sustained in the fire. Many of the survivors were badly scarred and they suffered health problems caused by the fire for the remainder of their lives. After leaving 10 people dead or dying, Hedin drove to a lake about three miles away from the nursing home. He ate a meal of sausages and wrote a suicide note. In the note, he confessed to staring the fire at the brewery when he was 16 and to killing Nielsen and stealing his money. He used the money to buy a new vehicle. He also confessed to the wake of devastation he had just caused. He also said he went on the killing spree because he lost his dream job. He wanted to be a cop and catch bad guys. He signed off the letter with the designation murderer. 
In the postscript of the suicide note, he said that he killed his parents because he didn't want them to live with the knowledge of what he had done. Hadeen's body was found weighted down with rocks in the lake the next day. Haradeen's rampage is the worst mass murder and killing spree in modern Swedish history. Number 1. Edward Lute Edward Lutz joined the Seaside Heights, New Jersey Police Department in the mid-1980s and he was a decorated officer. He had a meticulous record and he was the department's weapons expert. He was also assigned to the department's special assault team. Lutz lived in Toms River, New Jersey and he was divorced from his wife. He won custody of his daughter, Sarah, and he was raising her alone. Edward became close with several of his neighbors in his middle-class neighborhood. His neighbors who lived across the street, Dominic and Gail Galliano, babysat Sarah on mornings that Edward had to work. In the late 1990s, Edward met Cindy Mansway and they started dating. Not long after they started dating, Cindy and her three children moved in with Edward and Sarah. In March 1999, Edward accused his neighbor, Dominic Galliano, of exposing himself to Sarah, who was eight at the time, while he was babysitting her. Edward filed charges not long afterwards. The allegations shocked the close-knit neighborhood. In the two years that it took for the case to go to trial, the people in the neighborhood started to take sides. Some people believed the Lutes, while other people thought that Dominic was innocent. The Williams family, who lived next door to Edward, thought that Sarah was lying. The main reason they believed she was lying was because Edward's girlfriend, Cindy, apparently told Tina Williams that she thought that Sarah wasn't being truthful. Edward was incredibly protective of his daughter and he refused to even consider the possibility that Sarah was lying and he considered anyone who even suggested that she was lying to be his enemy. Tina's husband, Gary Williams, testified as a character witness for Dominic at his trial in January 2001. The district attorney had no physical evidence or witnesses besides Sarah proving that any crime had been committed. The jury deliberated for an hour before acquitting Dominic of all charges. The verdict enraged Edward. When Dominic returned home after the trial, Edward screamed at him that he would have his day. Two months after the trial, Cindy, who was now Edward's fiance, was tragically killed. Her car collided with a school bus when she was on her way home from picking up her wedding dress. Edward took the loss of his fiance hard and he began to drink heavily. He also developed a gambling addiction and he was finding himself more in debt every day. Over the next year, anytime Edward would see the Gallianos or the Williams, he would yell insults or swear at them. The Williams had the tires on their car slashed three times and someone had thrown paint on one of their cars. The Gallianos also had their cars vandalized. The police never followed up on the vandalism. The families thought that the police weren't doing anything because Edward was a fellow officer. A few weeks later, Edward set up a projector to project a message onto the front of his house so that his message faced the Gallianos. In big bold letters, the message said, Every dad has his day. Edward's behavior at work had also changed. Edward was angry because he didn't receive a promotion he wanted and he felt underappreciated. Then on February 21, 2002, the police were called to a neighborhood in Tom's River because there had been a mass shooting involving a former police officer. The shooter was arrested and identified as 72-year-old John Maybe. Maybe had been an officer with the Newark Police Department 
and he retired in 1976 with a disability pension. People who knew him said that he was haunted by an accident that happened in 1971. He was off duty and driving a station wagon when he struck an 11 year old boy who was driving a go-kart that careened into traffic. It was a tragic accident and the boy's parents never blamed Maybe for his death. Sadly, the boy's mother died by suicide two years later. The accident, although not his fault, racked Maybe with guilt for years. When he retired, he became a bit of a recluse and his mental health took a turn for the worse. On February 21, 2002, he locked his wife in the basement of their home. He grabbed his 38 caliber revolver and walked down the road to his mother-in-law's home. When he got inside the home, he fatally shot his favorite granddaughter, 22-year-old Natalie Gingerelli. He then forced his 90-year-old mother-in-law to come with him to the home of Susan Kieran, another neighbor. He had his mother-in-law ring the doorbell and then when Kieran answered the door, he aimed a gun at her. Kieran said, God loves you, and then maybe shot her twice. He left her to die in the doorway of her house. Maybe returned home and he picked up some ammunition. He then went to the home of Thomas Luster and Suzanne Lavicia. They were both 27 and they were engaged to be married. Their wedding was just four months away. Maybe shot Luster five times and he shot Lavicia four times and then she fell face down. He stood over her and fired three more shots into her back. He then surrendered and confessed to the murders, but he didn't give a motive for his killing spree. It's suspected that he killed those neighbors because he thought they were noisy, but the police aren't certain about that. It's also not clear why he chose that day to go on his killing spree. The shooting happened about a mile away from where Edward Lutz lived. Edward talked about the shooting and it was clear that he empathized with Maybe. He said that he understood Maybe's need to lash out in rage. On April 9, 2002, a few months after John Maybe shot and killed four people in Tom's River, Edward Lutz armed himself with his department issued MP5 submachine gun. First, he walked across the street to the Galliano's home. He rang the doorbell and the couple's son, 25-year-old Christopher, opened the door. When he did, Edward opened fire on him, striking him several times. Gail, who was 49, came to the door to see what the loud noise was and Edward shot her as well. Then Edward tracked down Dominic. Dominic was shot more than anyone else. The Williams family had no idea that there was a shooting happening across the road. Teresa Williams, who is Tina and Gary's adult daughter, left her family's home to go get some food. While she was gone, Edward burst through the front door of the Williams home. He found 46-year-old Tina Williams sitting on the couch and he opened fire on her. He then turned the gun on her husband Gary and shot him as well. Tina and Gary's son, Robert, escaped the shooting by jumping out of a second story window. Edward ran from the house and he fled in his pickup truck. 911 was called, but it was too late for the victims. They were all pronounced dead at the scene. James Costello, the chief of police in Seaside Heights, and Edward's boss was alerted about the shooting and he was walking out of his home to his vehicle when he spotted Edward's truck. Edward sprayed bullets at him and he was struck three times. After shooting his boss, Edward drove away. Costello was rushed to the hospital and he survived. Edward was found the next day in his truck that was parked in the driveway of a home that he seemingly picked at random. He had taken his own life by shooting himself. Before he died, Edward called his daughter Sarah and left a voicemail 
saying that he killed all the bad people in her life. He also said that since he was a police officer, he couldn't go to prison. John Maybe, who killed his granddaughter and three neighbors, pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to 30 years of prison. Number 3. Sylvia Segrist Sylvia Segrist was born on July 31, 1960, in Crumlin, Pennsylvania. She was the only child of Ruth and Don Segrist. When Sylvia was younger, it seemed like she had a bright future. She had friends, and she excelled in school. But when she was 13, she told her mother, Ruth, that her paternal grandfather had sexually abused her when she was 8 years old. Not long after Ruth learned this, Sylvia's behavior started to change. She started acting rebellious, and she started smoking marijuana, and she acted promiscuously. As Sylvia progressed into her teens, her behavior became even more erratic. When Sylvia was 15, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. After she was diagnosed, she was hospitalized for a short time. After she was released, Sylvia's erratic behavior continued. She also started acting more violently. One time, she choked her mother. Another time, she stabbed a guidance counselor at her school. She also threw a lit cigarette in a therapist's face. These incidents would lead to brief stays in a psychiatric hospital. In December 1984, 24-year-old Sylvia enlisted in the army. But she was released from the army two months later because of behavioral problems. Sylvia was deeply upset by this. For some time, she had been obsessed with the military, and she often wore military fatigues. Sylvia first started to get homicidal fantasies when she was 20 years old. Before and after her stint in the army, Sylvia would go to public places like a McDonald's or the Springfield Mall in Springfield Township, Pennsylvania, and threaten to shoot the places up. Sylvia also seemed to identify with mass murderer James Huberty. On July 18, 1984, Huberty went to a McDonald's in San Diego, California and started shooting random people. Huberty ended up killing 21 people and injuring another 19. He was eventually shot to death by a police sniper. At the end of March 1985, Sylvia bought a Ruger semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle from a department store. To purchase the $107 rifle, she was required to fill out paperwork. The paperwork asked if she had a history of mental illness, and Sylvia lied and indicated that she did not. When, in reality, over the past 10 years, Sylvia had been hospitalized a dozen times because of her mental illness. But she would only stay hospitalized for several weeks, at most, and then she would be released. Sylvia's mother, Ruth, was worried that her daughter was dangerous. Ruth wanted her daughter hospitalized for more extended periods. But, at the time, it was hard to hospitalize someone against their will in Pennsylvania. So Sylvia would stay in the hospital, then she'd be released, and she'd go back to threatening to shoot up public places. In July 1985, Ruth wrote an article for the newspaper, the Springfield Press, about the difficulties of having a mentally ill child who is also dangerous. She wrote that parents needed some way to protect themselves from their dangerous children. She wrote that she and parents dealing with similar circumstances were desperate and they needed to get protection. 
Ruth asks what needs to happen before they could get help, writing, what do you need, blood on the floor? Three months after the article was published, on the day before Halloween 1985, 25-year-old Sylvia Seagrass went to the pharmacy at the Springfield Mall. She tried to get her medication, but she was denied because she didn't have her welfare card. It's believed that the denial of the drugs helped push Sylvia over the edge. Sylvia heard voices and they encouraged her to hurt people. The voices also told her that everyone was against her. So Sylvia went home and grabbed her rifle. She loaded the pockets of her camo pants with bullets and drove back to the Springfield Mall. She parked her car, got out, and fired at the first man she saw. The man was just walking out of the mall. Sylvia missed with her first shot and the man was able to get to safety. Sylvia then fired at a woman who was using an ATM. She also missed her. Then she sprayed bullets at a family who were entering a restaurant. Two-year-old Hasevi Cosman was hit in the chest and he died from his wounds. His two cousins, 10-year-old Tiffany Woodson and 9-year-old Karen Woodson, were also shot, but they survived. They were all with Hasevi's parents, who were not shot. Sylvia then entered the mall and started firing at random. She would walk by some stores and do nothing. Then she would randomly fire into other stores. At the mall that day was 67-year-old retired physician Ernest Trout. Trout had just made a purchase and he didn't realize that Sylvia was walking around firing her rifle. He unknowingly walked out of the store in front of her. Sylvia shot him three times and he later died from his wounds. 64-year-old Augusto Ferreira also didn't realize that someone was shooting up the mall. He also accidentally walked into Sylvia's field of vision. He too was shot to death. Jean Lafer was a 24-year-old grad student, an EMT, and a volunteer firefighter. He was at the mall that day, and Sylvia walked up to him and raised her gun. Lafer thought it was a prank, and he yanked the gun away from her. He thought that Sylvia had just been firing blanks as part of a disturbing Halloween prank. He then pulled her into a store to wait for security. When some security guards arrived at the store, one of them asked Sylvia why she did it. She responded by saying, my family makes me nervous. In total, Sylvia Seagrass killed three people and injured seven other people. After Sylvia was arrested, she was held in a psychiatric hospital. In March 1986, she was found competent to stand trial. She went to trial in June 1986, about seven months after the shooting. Sylvia's lawyers argued that she was not guilty because of her mental illness. The prosecutor presented evidence that Sylvia had been playing the shooting for some time and she was aware of what she was doing. The jury deliberated for nine hours. Their verdict was guilty but mentally ill. Sylvia was given three consecutive life sentences for the three counts of murder and seven ten-year sentences for the attempted murder charges. She was sent to serve her sentence at the State Correctional Institution, Muncie, which is in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. At the time of this video, she is still incarcerated there. 
She is 59 years old. She is expected to die behind bars. After the mall shooting, Sylvia's mother, Ruth, became a mental health advocate. Number 2. Opal Collins Ben Collins Jr. from Louisa, Kentucky, served in World War II. He survived the war and he continued to serve in the Army. In 1947, when Ben Jr. was 20, he was in a car accident during his Army service. The accident left him paralyzed from the chest down. He received a settlement of $10,000 which is about $115,000 in 2019. He also received a pension from the Army. Ben Jr. lived with his father, Ben Sr., his mother, Julia, his two younger sisters, Martha Ann and Mary Sue, and his younger brother, Bobby. About five years after the accident, an attractive 22-year-old woman named Opal took an interest in Ben Jr., who was 25. They started spending a lot of time together. At first, the Collins family was not sure what to think of Opal. But it wasn't long before Ben Jr.'s mother, Julia, disproved of their relationship. One major reason Julia didn't approve of the relationship was because she was sure that Opal was abusing Ben Jr. Julia may have also not liked Opal's background. Opal had been married twice and she had two children but had custody of neither. She first got married when she was 14. In early 1956, the Collins family moved to Hammond, Indiana. It is suspected that one of the main reasons the family moved out of state was to get away from Opal. But in mid-April 1956, Opal relocated to Hammond and injected herself back into Ben Jr.'s life. A few weeks later, on May 1st, 1956, Ben Jr. and Opal got married. Opal moved in with the Collins. Every day that she lived in the house, it was tension-filled. Fights broke out, especially between Opal and her mother-in-law, Julia. Supposedly, Julia told Opal that she used their marriage certificate as toilet paper. It wasn't long before Opal demanded that Ben Jr. kick his family out. But because of his disability, Ben Jr. relied on his family, so he wouldn't even consider forcing his family to move out. Then, several weeks into the marriage, Opal demanded that Ben Jr. sign over the deed to the house and his life insurance over to her. Ben Jr. refused. Opal snapped and physically attacked Ben Jr. When the fight broke out, they were in the garage and a neighbor saw the attack. The neighbor broke it up. On day 23 of the marriage, Ben Jr. met with a lawyer and filed for divorce. Three days later, on May 26, 1956, Opal was still living in the house. That afternoon, while 28-year-old Ben Jr. was lying in bed, Opal, who was 25, went into her mother-in-law and father-in-law's bedroom and picked up a 22 caliber rifle and loaded it with 16 bullets. She then went into the living room where she shot 11-year-old Mary Sue twice. Opal then went after her mother-in-law, 50-year-old Julia, and her 14-year-old sister-in-law, Martha Ann. As they huddled together, Opal unloaded the rifle at them. Julia was shot five times and Martha Ann was shot nine times. 
When the shooting started, Ben Jr. was in his bed. Due to his disability, he was not able to get out of the bed. He obviously listened as his mother and his two sisters were shot to death. Then he heard Opal walk upstairs to his room while she loaded the gun. Then she entered the bedroom and aimed the rifle at him. Opal supposedly told Ben Jr. that if she couldn't have him, then no one could. Opal shot him once, killing him. The youngest of the Collins family, six-year-old Bobby, had been watching TV when the shooting started. When Bobby saw Opal with the rifle, he ran to his neighbor's home and got help. The police arrived at the Collins' home and they arrested Opal. Julia, Ben Jr., Martha Ann, and Mary Sue Collins were all pronounced dead. Ben Sr. wasn't at home at the time of the shooting because he was working at a steel mill. Oval Collins went to trial in October 1956. It was only for the murder of Mary Sue Collins. Her lawyer argued that she was insane at the time of the murders. But the jury did not believe it. They found Opal guilty and a judge sentenced her to death. Her death sentence was to be carried out on February 15, 1957 and she would have been the first woman to be executed in the state of Indiana. But then, nearly a month and a half after she was sentenced to death, the governor commuted her sentence to life. This would have allowed Opal to apply for parole in 1981, if not earlier. It's unclear what happened to Opal Collins after her sentence was commuted. If she is still alive today, she would be 86 years old. Number 1. Olga Hebnavero Olga Hebnavero was born in June 1951 in Prague, Czech Republic. Her mother, Anna, was a dentist, and her father, Antonin, was a bank clerk. Olga claimed that her parents were cold and indifferent to her. She also said that her father beat her. Olga's school life wasn't much better than her home life. She was an awkward loner. Also, she used to apparently get into fights and arguments with random people on the street or on the tram. Since Olga had problems in nearly every aspect of her life, Olga said she only felt good when she was asleep. When Olga was 13, she attempted to take her own life by overdosing on pills. She survived but she was hospitalized in a mental asylum for a year. Her year in the asylum did not improve her social skills. Her hatred for people also grew. Olga's father owned a house out in the country. He had inherited the house and he rented it to two people. In August 1970, when Olga was 19, she set the house on fire while the two residents and her sister were inside of it. The fire was extinguished before it caused too much damage and no one was hurt. No one suspected that Olga set the fire. As an adult, Olga had several jobs, but she would always get fired because she didn't get along with any of her co-workers. Olga dated both men and women, but her relationships never lasted. In 1971, she moved into a cottage that was only about 10 feet by 10 feet. She ended up living there alone for two years and then sold it in the spring of 1973. With the money from the sale of the cottage, she bought a car, which she supposedly loved. 
As early as the age of 16, Olga had fantasies about killing a large group of strangers. In the spring of 1973, Olga decided to make her fantasies a reality. After several months of planning, in July 1973, just days after her 22nd birthday, Olga's plan started to unfold. First, she wrote two letters to two different newspapers in Prague. Both letters were very similar. The second letter reads, Today, on July 8th, I will steal a bus and drive it into a crowd at full speed. I will cause the deaths of X people. I will be judged and punished. And this is my confession. Olga then wrote about how she had been bullied her entire life and gave examples of harassment she had endured. She then closes off the letter writing, Personal balance, I'm a sexual cripple, unable to establish a human relationship. I'm a devastated human, a human destroyed by humans. So, I have a choice, kill myself or kill others. And I decide as follows, I will return to my hate. If I left as an unknown suicide, it would be too cheap for you. This is my judgment. I, Olga Hebnevero, the victim of your bestiality, condemn you to death. But she did not send the letters after she wrote them. Instead, the day after she wrote the second letter, she pushed her car down into a ravine. Her car was found the next day, which was July 10th, 1973. By the time it was found, Oga had posted her two letters and she was out looking for a bus to steal. Instead of a bus, Oga found a large truck. Oga had practiced driving large vehicles and a few days earlier, she had even got her license to drive large vehicles. She then drove the truck to Prague 7. She found a spot on a street called Defenders of the Peace that was uphill from a tram stop. At about 1.45 p.m., she started driving towards the tram stop. But then, at the last second, she changed her mind and she didn't drive into the people waiting for the tram. It was not because she had any second thoughts or worries of regret. She just didn't think that the crowd of people was big enough. So she drove back up to her spot on the hill. Then she saw about 25 people were standing at the tram stop. She drove down the hill and then calmly turned onto the sidewalk and drove the truck directly into the people waiting for the tram. A taxi driver witnessed the ramming and he called his dispatch center to request that medical help be sent to the scene. A police officer was nearby and he ran to the truck. He opened the driver's door and he found 22-year-old Olga Hebnevero sitting behind the wheel. The shocked police officer asked Olga if she had fallen asleep at the wheel. Olga said, No, I didn't fall asleep and the brakes are fine. I deliberately entered the sidewalk and it's my revenge for the way I've been treated all my life. Olga was arrested and taken to the police station. Meanwhile, 17 people that she hit were taken to the hospital. Three people died at the scene. Over the next several days, five more people died from the wounds they sustained. The other five people who were at the tram stop were uninjured. At the police station, Olga confessed that she wanted to kill as many people as she could. What shocked the detectives who interviewed her was that she showed no remorse or regret for what she had done. Then two days after she murdered eight people and injured 12 others, 
Olga's confession letters arrived at the newspapers. The letters confirmed that Olga was a cold-blooded killer who wanted to hurt as many people as she could. At Olga's trial, which was held in April 1974, about nine months after the mass murder, her lawyer tried to argue that she was schizophrenic. But the prosecutor had plenty of evidence, like the two confession letters, that showed that Olga was clearly in her right mind when she committed the crime and she knew the consequences of what she was doing. Olga was ultimately found guilty and on April 6, 1974, she was sentenced to death. On March 12, 1975, 23-year-old Olga Hebnavero was hanged. She was the last woman to be executed in the Czech Republic. Number 3. The Bar de Telephone Massacre Bar de Telephone, or the Telephone Bar in English, was located in Marseille, France. The bar was owned and operated by 35-year-old André Lyon and his wife, Nicole. They were hard-working people with no criminal connections. Bar de Telephone wasn't a known hangout for criminals. Just after 8 o'clock on the night of October 3rd, 1978, there were nine customers in the bar. All of them were in their 20s. One young man was there celebrating the fact that he got his driver's license. Several of the other young men were playing cards. At around 8.15 p.m., Nicole Leone was walking from the back towards the bar. She saw three or four men wearing stockings over their heads and they were armed with guns. They were walking into the bar, so she ran upstairs to an apartment and she barricaded herself inside of it. Downstairs in the bar, the men started shooting. The shooting lasted for about four and a half minutes. The shooters then walked out to their car and drove away. When everything went quiet, someone called for help. By the time the police and the paramedics arrived, it was too late for eight of the customers and the owner. The ninth customer was taken to the hospital, but he died from his wounds 17 days later. It appeared that the first victims were shot in the head, and one victim was shot in the neck. The other victims were all shot in the abdomen. Because of the amount of bodies and blood, the police compared the crime scene to a war zone. But they did note the efficiency of the killers. In total, 20 shots were fired, and 18 of them entered a human body. There was not a single broken glass or bottle in the bar, and nothing else was out of place or disturbed. Had ten people not been shot in the bar, nothing would have looked out of the ordinary. It turned out that four of the nine customers were known to the police. Two of them had recently spent time in jail. So the police immediately suspected that the ten murders were connected to organized crime. In the 1970s, France had a relatively low crime rate. But they did have a big problem with organized crime, especially in Marseille. Marseille was an integral part of a drug smuggling ring called the French Connection. As early as the 1930s, the raw material to make heroin was shipped from mainland Southeast Asia, and then later Turkey, into Marseille, which is a coastal city. In Marseille, it was processed into heroin and then was smuggled into Canada and the United States, where it was sold. The trafficking ring was the basis of the 1969 book, The French Connection by Robin Moore, which was adapted into the 1971 movie of the same name. 
The police thought that the massacre was the product of the ongoing war between mobster Tanny Zamba, aka the Great, or the Emperor of the Night, and his rival, Jackie Bear, who is also known as Jack Lamad, which in English is Jack the Madman. The more the police investigated the massacre, the less convinced they became that it was a case of gang warfare. Since the gunman killed everyone in the bar in four and a half minutes, and 18 of the 20 shots found their mark, the police thought that was a professional job. But in other ways, the murders didn't resemble a mafia hit. Typically, they didn't kill civilians. While four of the victims were known to the police, the investigators could not connect any of the victims to any major crime syndicate. So the police eventually ruled out the idea that the murders were connected to any of the mafias operating in Marseille. The police also thought that the murders might have been connected to counterfeit money. One of the victims was part of a counterfeit money trafficking ring. But this route of investigation did not lead to an arrest. The police noted that only one of the victims had been shot in the neck. It turned out that the man who was shot in the neck was a pimp who had recently served time in jail for burglary. The police investigated him and they found out that while he was in jail, another pimp had taken control of the sex workers who had worked for him. Supposedly, the man had asked his rivals to meet him at the bar. But his rivals decided that they didn't want to talk. They came to the bar armed with guns and they planned on killing him. Apparently, someone in the bar pulled off the lower part of one of the gunmen's masks. They recognized the gunman and even said his name. So the gunman decided to kill everyone in the bar to eliminate the witnesses. While the police thought it was a plausible explanation, they didn't find any physical evidence to prove it. Notably, the murder weapons were never found. Also, the crime scene was trampled on pretty thoroughly. Many police officers and even some reporters were in and out of the bar in the hours after the murders. As a result, the police did not have much in the way of physical evidence. The police thought that they could only make an arrest if someone confessed. They never got a confession, so they never made an arrest. Surprisingly, at the time, the murders of 10 people were not considered a big deal by the city officials. After the massacre, the mayor of Marseille said, in Marseille, the hoodlums kill each other. It is less serious than crimes in other parts of France. No one has killed a magistrate in Marseille. The last sentence was a reference to the murder of a magistrate by gangsters three years earlier in the city of Lyon. Two years later, the mayor may have regretted saying that. In France, there's a position called investigating judge. They often oversee criminal investigations and do things like authorize wiretaps and sign warrants. The investigating judge on the Bar de Telephone massacre was 36-year-old Pierre Michel. On October 21st, 1981, just over two years after the massacre, Michelle was shot to death. The killer was on the back of a motorcycle that was driven by another man. For five years, the case went unsolved. Then a chemist associated with the French connection admitted that the assassination was ordered by a gangster, a Francois Girard. Gerard was a close associate of another gangster named Francois Scapula. Together, they were major players in the French connection. It's unknown if the assassination was connected to the massacre. 
Some people suspect that Michelle learned something vital and he was killed to silence him. But no evidence of that has ever been found. At the time of this video, the Bar to Telephone Massacre is considered a cold case and unless someone comes forward with information about the mass murder, the case will likely never be solved. Number 2. The Burger Chef Murders Speedway is a small town in Indiana. At the tail end of the 1970s, the town had a population of around 13,000 people. As its name implies, it is home to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. November 17, 1978 was a Friday. 17-year-old Brian Kring worked at a Burger Chef restaurant in Speedway, but he had that night off. Burger Chef was a fast food chain that was started in Indianapolis, Indiana, and at its peak, there were over a thousand franchises. Just after midnight, Brian went to the restaurant to visit some of his co-workers. He was expecting to find four employees closing up for the night. That night, 20-year-old Jane Freet was working as the assistant manager. The crew that night was 18-year-old Ruth Ellen Shelton, 16-year-old Daniel Davis, and 16-year-old Mark Flemons. When Brian got to the restaurant, he was surprised to find the back door ajar. He walked into the restaurant and found no one there. He checked the manager's office and it was trashed. Also, that day's revenue was missing. It was about $581. Brian got a bad feeling, so he called the police, who arrived a few minutes later. The police checked with the parents of the four employees, and they learned that none of them had made it home. But the police did not think that anything too sinister had happened. They thought that the four employees took off with the money and went out partying. However, not everyone was convinced that the four employees ripped off the store for a night out on the town. It seemed out of character for all four of them because they were all considered responsible people. Also, Jane and Ruth's purses were found in the restaurant. Many people did not think that they would leave the restaurant willingly without them. About four hours later, Jane's car was found abandoned a short distance from the restaurant. That morning, Jane, Ruth, Daniel, and Mark still had not returned home. Because the police thought it was a minor case of embezzlement, they didn't treat the Burger Chef restaurant like a crime scene. Since it wasn't a crime scene, the Burger Chef staff was able to clean up and open for business the morning after the crew went missing. Saturday passed and no one saw or heard from the four fast food employees. On Sunday afternoon, a couple was walking through some woods on their property that was about 20 miles from the restaurant. They found the dead bodies of 20-year-old Jane Freed, 18-year-old Ruth Ellen Shelton, 16-year-old Daniel Davis, and 16-year-old Mark Flemons. They were all dressed in their work uniforms. The police were called out to the woods. Ruth and Daniel's bodies were lying next to each other. They both had been shot multiple times, execution style. The other two bodies were found a short distance away, but apart. The locations of the bodies formed a triangle. Jane had been stabbed twice in the chest with a knife that had a 5 inch blade. The handle of the knife broke off and the blade was found in her chest. Margaret suffered a head injury, but that was not the cause of death. 
He drowned on his own blood after suffering an internal injury. None of the victims were bound. The police were somewhat able to piece together what happened that night. When cleaning up for the night, the Burger Chef staff kept the doors locked. The exception was when they took garbage out the back door. The police think that one of the employees took the garbage out and at least two men forced their way into the restaurant. They pocketed the money and trashed the manager's office. The police have speculated that one of the staff members knew or recognized one of the robbers and that's why they were killed. Nevertheless, they were all forced into Jane's car and they were driven to another vehicle that was parked close to where Jane's car was abandoned. Then they were driven to the property with the woods. Once there, they were led into the center of the woods. The police think that Ruth and Daniel were forced to get on their knees and then they were shot by one person. At some point, Jane and Mark tried to escape and most likely ran in opposite directions. Jane did not make it very far before she was tackled and stabbed. According to Julie Young, author of the book The Burger Chef Murders in Indiana, the original pathologist thought that Mark ran into a tree. This caused the internal injury and then he fell onto his back and drowned in his own blood. Years later, media outlets would report that Mark had been beaten to death with a chain. After the mass murder made the news, two witnesses came forward and they said that they saw two men behind the restaurant shortly before the staff members were kidnapped. The witnesses said that the men were dressed in shabby clothes. One was clean cut and the other one had a beard. The police consider the sketches to be their only lead. Unfortunately, the police didn't have much physical evidence because the restaurant had been cleaned up the morning after the kidnapping and had been open to the public. So if there was any physical evidence there, it was gone forever. The police also didn't find much evidence in the woods. Notably, they did not find the gun or the handle of the knife. The police were baffled by the crime. Why would anyone kidnap and kill four people over $581? A psychologist theorized that the killers were most likely on drugs. The police investigated local drug addicts, but it did not lead to an arrest. Over the next year, there were several promising persons of interest, but no one was charged with the murders. The 1970s came to an end without an arrest. Then in December 1984, just over six years after the murders, a reporter with the Indianapolis Star, Dan Luzadder, got a call from a man who was in the Marion County Jail. The man said he was looking at some serious prison time, but he had an interesting tip to share. So Luzadder agreed to meet the man in the county jail. The man told Luzadder he knew who committed the Burger Chef murders. He said it was two men. One of the men had been a suspect in the case. The second man was 33-year-old Donald Ray Forrester. At the time, Forrester was serving a 95-year prison sentence. In April 1979, he and a friend forced a woman to get into their vehicle at gunpoint. She was then driven to a nearby town where she was sexually assaulted. The woman escaped by jumping out of a moving car while she was naked. Forrester and his accomplice were arrested after someone saw sketches that were drawn from the victim's description of her attackers. 
Donald Forrester was far from what you would call an ideal prisoner. He was constantly threatening the prison staff and other inmates. In 1977, he took a prison counselor hostage with a knife. Forrester surrendered before anyone got hurt too seriously. In 1983, Forrester and two other inmates tried to escape from custody after they were taken to a local hospital for treatment. Forrester was recaptured quickly. Another inmate, 47-year-old Sylvester Brown, was shot to death by a sheriff's deputy. Dan Lozadder thought that the tip was worth looking into because Forrester had a history of violence and he was not incarcerated when the massacre happened. Lozadder learned that the police had considered Forrester a person of interest in the Burger Chef murders. He had taken two polygraph exams and he failed both. The police suspected, at the very least, he knew something about the murders. The district attorney had even offered him a lesser sentence on the sexual assault conviction if he gave them information on the Burger Chef murders. But Forrester claimed he didn't know anything about the quadruple homicide. In the summer of 1985, Lazare went to the prison to interview Forrester. Lozadder told him he was there to talk about the Burger Chef murders and he asked the Point Blake if he did it. Forrester said he did not do it. But he did say he knew who did it. Forrester said that it was two men and he helped them dispose of the evidence after the fact. Forrester said he would reveal who the men were if he got a new trial for the sexual assault charges. Lozadder agreed to talk to the police and the district attorney's office. After Lozadder's first visit, he learned something interesting. In 1979, Forrester's ex-wife told the police that Forrester took her to an area near the murder site weeks after they happened. She said that Forrester looked around and found six shell casings on the ground. He picked up the shell casings, he brought them back to her home, and then he flushed them down the toilet. After Lazare met Forrester in jail, investigators went to the home of Forrester's ex-wife and they opened up the septic tank. Inside, they found six shell casings. The detectives took Forrester out of the prison and they wanted him to point out where he lived in Speedway while he was on parole. The detectives drove Forrester around for several days, but he did not remember what house he used to live in. He finally picked one, and the detectives were slightly encouraged after they talked to the owner of the home. Forrester and another man, a drug dealer, had been accused of committing the Burger Chef murders. It turned out that the drug dealer used to work with the owner of the house. The backyard was searched, but nothing of interest was found. Forrester was hypnotized, and then he was driven around again. He picked a different house immediately. But a search of the property produced nothing. In October 1986, eight years after the massacre, Forrester told the police a new story. He said he had been at a meeting three days before the murders. Another man was the ringleader and they were going to collect a drug debt that was owed by Jane Freed. Forrester said that the other man at the meeting went to the restaurant and they confronted Jane. But then, Mark Flemings tried to help her, and there was a fight. Mark ended up falling and hitting his head on the bumper of a vehicle. They thought that Mark was dead, or he was going to die, so they decided to eliminate the witnesses. The police investigated the details of Forrester's new story. 
It turned out that the man Forrester named as the ringleader was in prison at the time of the murders. Forrester was confronted about his lie a few weeks later. Forrester then admitted he was involved in the robbery and he was the one who shot Ruth Ellen Shelton and Daniel Davis. He accurately described the positions of the bodies and he knew how each victim was killed. But then, a week later, Forrester recanted and said the confession was coerced. He said he was only at the meeting days before the murders and he helped get rid of the evidence afterward. The authorities were never sure if Donald Forrester was involved in the Burger Chef murders or if he was just an attention-seeking troublemaker. Forrester was constantly a problem for prison officials. The police investigation into Forrester regarding the Burger Chef murders had to be paused several times because Forrester would be placed in a solitary confinement for disciplinary reasons. The investigators also caught Forrester lying several times. They noted that he did know the positions of the bodies and how each victim was killed, but that did not prove he physically murdered any of them. Also, nothing else Forrester told them turned out to be true. For example, Forrester said that the handle of the knife and the gun were thrown off a bridge into a river. The river was dragged and neither were found. The police questioned the former drug dealer who was accused of committing the Burger Chef murders with Forrester. The man said he had nothing to do with the murders. He pointed out that he had already been cleared as a suspect. The police had no physical evidence to connect the man to the crime. The man's name has never been made public. The only evidence against Forrester was his confession and the district attorney did not think that the confession was strong. The district attorney noted that Forrester said that the murder stemmed from a drug debt collection that went wrong. It turned out that it was not the first time that the police heard that theory. In 1981, Jane's brother, James Freed, was arrested for selling cocaine. The police decided to question him about his sister's murder. James said that he heard that Mark Flemings owed a pot dealer $7,000. James also said that a lot of drug dealers worked out of the burger shaft. For these reasons, James thought that the murders were connected to drugs. James's theory about the motive was then printed in the newspaper. The district attorney thought it was possible that Forrester read James's theory about Jane's murder and he simply told the police the same thing. Since there was no physical evidence and the confession had holes in it, Forrester was never charged with the Burger Chef murders. Today, it's unknown who committed the murders. Some people think it was a drug debt collection that turned deadly if Forrester was involved. Donald Forrester died in prison in June 2006 at the age of 55. Other people think it was a robbery and the employees were killed as a way for the robbers to cover their tracks. One of the employees may have even knew or recognized one of the robbers. Or the murders could be the work of two thrill killers. Unfortunately, unless someone comes forward with information regarding the massacre, we may never know who killed Jane Freed, Ruth Ellen Shelton, Daniel Davis, and Mark Flemings. At the time of this video, the case of the Burger Chef murders is considered open but inactive. Number 1. The Dreyfuses June 15, 1994 was the hottest day on record in Pulaski County, Pennsylvania. The Dreyfus family lived in a mobile home 
on a rural road in the county. The night before, seven-year-old Jacqueline Dreyfus and her four-year-old sister, Heather, had their five-year-old cousin, Stephanie Herko, sleep over. This was not unusual, as Jacqueline and Heather saw their cousin Stephanie once a week. On that hot day in late spring, the girls picked daisies and they went swimming at their grandmother's home. They were back at their mobile home by two o'clock that afternoon. Jacqueline and Heather's mother, 34-year-old Bonnie, was home alone with the girls. Her husband and the girl's father, Tom Dreyfus, who went by Jake, was out for the day. Jake and his father had gone to Ohio for business. Jake claimed that they took his father's car on the trip because they had dropped off his car at the auto mechanic's shop that morning. Jake claimed that his father dropped him off at home on that hot June day at about 3 p.m. The front door was locked and he had to use his key to unlock it. Jay claimed that in the kitchen he found his 34 year old wife, Bonnie, stabbed to death. In the back room he found the dead bodies of Jacqueline, Heather and Stephanie. They were all dressed in their swimsuits. Bonnie had been stabbed 28 times. Jacqueline suffered 14 stab wounds, while her sister, Heather, had been stabbed 16 times. Their cousin had been killed with 6 stab wounds. Jay called 911 at 3.05 p.m. and first responders arrived at the scene. They were shocked by the crime scene. There was blood splattered in the bathroom and the kitchen. A forensic expert thought that the attack lasted about three minutes. One thing that the police noted was that Jake had almost no blood on him. There was only a single spot of blood on one of his hands. Jake explained that he touched one of the girl's bodies because he thought she might have been alive. The more the police investigated the brutal quadruple homicide, the more they began to suspect that Jake was the killer. Notably, there were no signs of a break-in and there were no signs of forced entry. The police found the back door locked and Jake said when he got home, the front door was locked. This suggests that Bonnie knew her killer. Also, the murders were overkill, which the police thought was a clue that the killings were personal. The police talked to Jake and Bonnie's friends and family. Several of them also thought that Jake was the killer. They said that Bonnie thought that Jake drank too much and smoked too much pot. She had threatened to leave him several times before. Jake told a friend that the night before the murders, he and Bonnie did not sleep together. The police thought that this meant that they had a fight. The police noted that nothing was stolen from the home. Bonnie's wedding ring was found on the floor of the trailer. The police speculated that Jake and Bonnie got into a fight the night before the murders and they slept apart. Jake went to Ohio with his father and when he got home, the fighting started up again. Bonnie took off her wedding ring and possibly threw it at Jake. Then Jake snapped and killed everyone in the home. Jake's best friend even thought he might have done it. He thought that the girls might have been pestering him right after he walked in the door. He may have hit one of the girls and this caused Bonnie to get angry. They started fighting and Jake ended up killing everyone. While there were both possible explanations, the police did not find any evidence that Jake was the killer. 
Notably, the police did not think that Jake had enough time to commit the murders and clean himself off. The last person to talk to Bonnie was her sister and Stephanie's mother, Mary Herco. Mary and Bonnie were talking on the phone at 2.25 p.m. Mary told the police that Bonnie said that someone had pulled into her driveway and she said goodbye and then hung up the phone. Jake said he got home at about 3 o'clock and then he called 911 at about 3.05. Therefore, the murders happened during those 40 minutes. Forensic experts knew that the killer would have been splattered with blood. But Jake only had one drop of blood on his hand. The murder weapon was missing and has never been found. Jake and his father said that he got dropped off at home at around 3 p.m. and the police believed them about the timeline. That meant that Jake did not have enough time to thoroughly clean himself up and dispose of the murder weapon and the blade clothes before the first responders arrived on the scene. Especially since he did not have his vehicle, which he said he dropped off at the mechanic's shop that morning. For these reasons, Jake Dreyfus was cleared as a suspect. Months after the murders, there was a deposition regarding the massacre. Mary Herco testified, and she told a slightly different story about what happened that afternoon. Mary said that just before her sister hung up the phone, she said she had to go because Jake was home. 18 months after the murders, no arrests had been made. Two new investigators were assigned to the case, and they vowed to solve it. They did not consider Jake Dreyfus a suspect. They just didn't think that he had the time to kill everyone and get rid of the evidence. Instead, they had another suspect. He was 34-year-old Thomas Kimball. Kimball was a cocaine addict who was well known to the police for misdemeanor crimes. He lived about a mile from the crime scene. A witness said that he saw Kimball hitchhiking near the family's mobile home on the day of the murders. Hours after the murders, Kimball was arrested for stealing a bike not far from the crime scene. The detectives talked to Kimball's friends and neighbors. Supposedly, an hour after the bodies were discovered, Kimball had talked to several people about the murders. But, at that point, the murders were not public knowledge. After Kimball was arrested, other people came forward and said that he had bragged about being the killer. A former roommate said that one time, Kimball pointed out the mobile home to him and he said he killed the people in it. A jailhouse informant also came forward and said that Kimball talked to him about the murders. He said that Kimball said it was a drug deal gone bad. Thomas Kimball's trial started in April 1998, 16 months after he was arrested and nearly four years after the murders. There was no physical evidence that linked him to the crime scene. The only evidence was the testimony of the witnesses. One man claimed he drove by the home around the time of the murders and he saw Kimball nearby. The man admitted he was driving 55 miles per hour and Kimball was 100 feet away, but he was still sure that he saw Kimball. The other witnesses all said that Kimball bragged about being the killer. The prosecutor theorized that Kimball slaughtered the mother, her two daughters, and her niece because he was in a drug-induced frenzy. Kimball's lawyer pointed out that Kimball had an alibi for the time of the murders. He was at his mother's trailer. Kimball's sister phoned the trailer around the time of the murders and she spoke to Kimball. 
Kimmel's mother and sister both testified on his behalf. One of Kimball's mother's neighbors testified that she saw Kimball around the time that the killings were happening. Kimball's lawyer called Mary Herco to the stand. He asked Mary why, months after the murders, did she say that Bonnie told her that Jake had pulled into the driveway when she previously said that Bonnie had told her that someone had pulled into the driveway. The prosecutor objected to the line of questioning. He argued that Kimball's lawyer questioning his own witness about inconsistencies in their own statements would impeach the witness and at the time this was not allowed in Pennsylvania. The judge sustained the objection. So Kimball's lawyer was not able to ask Mary for clarification on what Bonnie said before she hung up. Kimball's lawyer also had an explanation as to why Kimball was talking about the murders before they were public knowledge. Kimball's mother owned a police scanner and he happened to be listening to it when the bodies were discovered. Finally, Kimball's lawyer pointed out that not a single piece of evidence proved that Kimball was ever in the mobile home, let alone proved beyond a reasonable doubt that he killed everyone in the home. The jury deliberated for three hours and 40 minutes. Thomas Kimball was found guilty of all four murders. In May 1998, Kimball was sentenced to death. His lawyer appealed and argued that there were eight major issues with the trial. In October 2000, nearly two and a half years after Kimball was sentenced to death, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that one of the issues in the appeal was problematic enough that Kimball's conviction should be overturned and he should be given a new trial. The issue was that Kimball's lawyer should have been able to ask Mary Herco about what her sister said on the phone just before she was killed. The ruling said that her testimony could have created reasonable doubt. Thomas Kimball went to trial again in April 2002. At Kimball's first trial, his lawyer tried to create reasonable doubt by showing that no evidence placed Kimball inside the mobile home and he suggested that someone else could have done it. But he never suggested a specific alternative suspect. At Kimball's second trial, his lawyer presented the jury with a clear alternative suspect. Jake Dreyfus. Jake said that on the day of the murders, he and his father dropped off his car at a mechanic shop. His father backed up his story. Kimball's lawyer had the owner of the mechanic shop testify. The owner said that he had no record of Jake dropping off his car at his shop on the day of the murders. The police did not think that Jake was the killer because they did not believe he had enough time to clean up and get rid of the murder weapon. It turned out, at the crime scene, two washcloths that were stained with blood were found. They were tested for DNA. An expert concluded that the DNA could have come from Jake. A medical examiner testified for the defense. On the stand, he examined photographs of Jake's hands that were taken by a police photographer on the day of the murders. The medical examiner pointed out that there were scratches on the back of his hands. He said that the marks were consistent with scratches made by fingernails. Jake's hands were also bruised and there was blood under his fingernails. Jake had told the police that he hurt his hands fixing his car. The medical examiner also testified that Kimball had a mild form of hemophilia. This caused him to bruise and bleed easily. Hours after the murders, Kimball was arrested for stealing a bike. The next day, he was examined at the local hospital 
and photographs of him were taken. The photographs show that he had no cuts or bruises. Kimball weighed about 100 pounds, while Bonnie weighed about 250 pounds. There was also evidence that Bonnie put up a fight. For example, there were marks in the ceiling that seemed to indicate she swung a chair at her killer. The medical examiner did not think that Kimball could have killed Bonnie without getting a cut or a bruise. This would be especially true if Kimball committed the murder in a drug-induced frenzy. The medical examiner also noted that Kimball was a cocaine addict who had ADHD and he had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So he probably would not have been thinking clearly enough to kill the whole family without leaving a single fingerprint, hair, or drop of blood behind, clean himself up, and then dispose of the bloody clothes and the knife without drawing attention to himself or leaving evidence around. The medical examiner said that he was sure that Jake Dreyfus was the killer and Thomas Kimball was innocent. He said that even the stab wounds were evidence of that. Jake's wife and daughters were stabbed over a dozen times each and his niece was stabbed six times. He said that because Jake had a closer emotional bond with his daughters, he spent more time on them and then quickly dispatched with his niece just because she happened to be there. On May 3rd, 2002, Thomas Kimball was found not guilty on all charges. After the trial, Jake Dreyfus moved out of the county. The consensus is, is that Thomas Kimball wrongly spent four years incarcerated. Two and a half of those years were spent on death row. At around 1.50 a.m. on the morning of April 16, 2011, nine years after Thomas Kimball was acquitted, Jake Dreyfus was driving in Beaver Township, Pennsylvania. He was driving in the wrong lane and then he collided head-on with another vehicle. Jake, who was 54, was pronounced dead seven hours later in the hospital. Over seven years later, on the last weekend of September 2018, Thomas Kimball was reported missing. His body was found days later, on October 2nd, in a wooded area. Thomas Kimball was 56 years old when he died. Foul play was not suspected in his death. No one else has ever been arrested for the murders of Bonnie Dreyfus, her two daughters, Jacqueline and Heather, and her niece, Stephanie Herko. Their murders are officially considered unsolved. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please check out our website, criminalist.com, where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash criminallylisted. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching. In today's video, we'll look at three groups of people who seemingly vanished into thin air. But before that, we want to bring you a word from our sponsor, Magellan TV, which is the best streaming service for documentaries. Recently, I watched a great documentary series on Magellan TV called Deadly Dates. The series details cases of people who were looking for love online only to be killed. Magellan TV is run by filmmakers, and Deadly Dates is just one of thousands of documentaries that they have available for streaming. Magellan TV also has history documentaries about some of the evilest people who ever lived. This ranges from demented killers to brutal dictators. Magellan TV also has some fascinating documentaries that are available in 4K. The documentaries are also ad-free. 
Magellan TV is easy to access. It can be watched anywhere at any time on your TV, laptop, or mobile device. It works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. You can even cast from your phone to your television. Right now, Magellan TV has a special offer for criminally listed viewers. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed and you'll get a month free. So get access to thousands of great documentaries and help criminally listed in the process by checking out Magellan TV. Number 3. Sarah Boyd, Kimberly Boyd, and Linda McCourt In the spring of 1987, Sarah Boyd was 32 years old. She was living in Harleyville, South Carolina with her husband, Philip Boyd, and their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Kimberly. On the night of April 3, 1987, Sarah and her friend, 32-year-old Linda McCord, attended a gospel concert at a church in Walterboro, South Carolina. Walterboro was about 30 miles from their home in Harleyville, South Carolina. They were driving a blue Lincoln that was owned by McCord's husband. They brought Sarah's daughter, Kimberly, with them. Sarah, Kimberly, and McCord were all seen at the concert between 10.30 and 11 p.m. At around midnight, Linda McCord's husband returned home from work and he was surprised to find that his wife was not home yet. At first, he was not too concerned. He just assumed she was at the Boyd's home or she was with a relative. But hours went by and she didn't return home. So he reported the missing that morning. Someone reported seeing a blue Lincoln traveling on Route 15 on the night Sarah, Kimberly, and McCord went missing. The car was seen traveling between Walterboro and Kennedy, South Carolina. The motorist was driving under the speed limit and another car was following it. But the witness could not remember anything about the second car and they did not get a good look at the driver. The day after the trio was reported missing, the police were notified that Blue Lincoln had been abandoned on the outskirts of Holly Hill, South Carolina. The person gave the police the license plate number and they learned that the car belonged to Linda McCord's husband. An officer drove McCord's husband out to the car to retrieve it. They opened the hood and discovered that a freezer plug had been blown out and the engine had overheated. When the car was discovered, the police did not consider the disappearance of the trio a crime, so the car was not examined for evidence. What was odd was the location where the car was found. After the trio didn't return home, the assumption was that they were traveling in the car and they started to have engine trouble. This would explain why they were driving slowly. The car broke down, then they left their vehicle to go call for help. Then something might have happened to them after they left the car. What was strange was that the women were driving north from Walterboro to their home in Harleyville. But for some reason, their car was found immobile less than 15 miles north of Harleyville. If they abandoned the car in that area because it wasn't working, they would have either driven past Harleyville or one of the highways that led to Harleyville. Why would they drive nearly 15 miles past their home? This is even odder if the women really were having car problems within 10 miles of Walterboro. The police also thought that if the car broke down, they would have called someone for help. But no one had heard from the women. The police conducted several land and air searches, but no other trace of the women or the toddler were found. The FBI was also brought in to aid in the investigation. The authorities thought that, because of the circumstances, Sarah, Kimberly, and McCord 
were victims of foul play, but they could not find any evidence that anything violent happened to the three females. In fact, besides the car, the police found nothing else of interest. A few weeks after the disappearance, one officer admitted that they were grasping at straws. Months and then years went by and no trace of Sarah Boyd, her daughter Kimberly, and her friend Linda McCord were found. Then, in 1990, about three years after the mass disappearance, someone used Sarah Boyd's credit card at a mall not far from her home. When the credit card was used, the police were notified. They checked the credit card slip and there was a signature. However, it was illegible and it did not match Sarah's signature. The police are not sure if the person who used the credit card had anything to do with the disappearance of the three females. For example, someone may have just found it and used it. Regardless, the credit card was never used again. It's also a mystery what happened to the card after it was used. Some people believe that the remains of two-year-old Kimberly Boyd have already been found. On December 21, 1988, the body of a young girl was found on the side of a dirt road near Waycross, Georgia. Waycross is about 220 miles from the area where the car was abandoned. It's believed that the girl was about three or four years old. She was wearing a white pullover shirt with a red pony stitched onto the upper left chest area and pajama pants. The medical examiner was not able to determine the cause of death. Someone had gone to a lot of trouble to hide the body. It had been wrapped in a brown blanket and placed in a gym bag. The bag was put into a steel suitcase and then cement was poured into the suitcase. The suitcase was placed into a TV console and then the console was boarded up with plywood. People have noted the physical similarities between Kimberly Boyd and the girl known as Baby Jane Doe. They also noted that Baby Jane Doe was encased in cement and Kimberly's father worked in construction so he had access to cement. But not everyone is convinced that the girl is Kimberly. Notably, baby Jane Doe had been dead for about one to two months before her body was found. Her body was found about 20 months after Kimberly Boyd went missing. But people point out that Kimberly only went missing then and there was no evidence that she was killed at that time. She could have been kept alive up until a few months before the body of baby Jane Doe was found. The police have never publicly spoken about the possibility of baby Jane Doe being Kimberly Boyd. In 2017, the police released a new 3D model of baby Jane Doe's head in the hopes that someone might recognize her. The disappearance of Sarah Boyd, her daughter Kimberly, and her friend Linda McCord is considered cold. The police are hoping for a break in the case, but they have very little physical evidence to suggest what might have happened to the trio. If they are alive today, Sarah Boyd and Linda McCord would be 64, and Kimberly Boyd would be 32, which is the age her mother was when they went missing. Number 2. The Martins In 1958, the Martin family lived in Portland, Oregon. Kenneth Martin, who was 54 years old, and his wife, 48-year-old Barbara, had four children. Donald was 28, Barbie was 14, Virginia, 13, and Susan, 11. In December 1958, Donald was serving in the Navy, and he was stationed in New York. On the night of December 6, Kenneth and Barbara attended a Christmas party. 
No one noticed anything off about the couple. Kenneth and Barbara returned home that night. The next afternoon, Kenneth, Barbara, and their three daughters piled into their 1954 Ford Country Squire. They had told people they were planning on driving out to the Columbia River Gorge to collect greenery to make Christmas decorations. The next morning, Kenneth did not show up for work. His employer thought that this was very strange because Kenneth was incredibly reliable. The girls' schools also noted that the girls were absent. That night, a friend of the family called the police and reported them missing. Officers went to the area where the family had planned to look for greenery. It was dark, so they only conducted a quick search. Meanwhile, other officers went to the family's home with some friends of the family. They found nothing out of sorts, and by all appearances, it seemed that the family planned on returning. Hundreds of volunteers looked for the five missing members of the Martin family. But notably, the eldest Martin child, 28-year-old Donald, did not return home to join the searches. One problem that the investigators had was that they couldn't find any evidence that the family actually made it to the Columbia River Gorge on the day they went missing. They told people that they were going there, but they could have stopped anywhere along the way. Or they could have simply changed their plans and went in a completely different direction. So they didn't even know what area would be best to search. On December 23, 1958, a little over two weeks after the family went missing, a credit card bill arrived at the family's home. On the day the family went missing, the credit card was used to buy gas in a small town called Cascade Logs, which is near the gorge. The police received a lot of calls from people who said that they saw the family. Several people recalled seeing a family that matched the description of the Martins at a restaurant in Hood River. A waitress said she was sure she had served the family burgers and fries. They spent about an hour in the restaurant and left at about 4.30. Several other people also reported seeing the family in the restaurant around the time the waitress said she had served them dinner. The family was traveling eastward. If it was the Martins who stopped at the restaurant, that would indicate that they were driving back home. Then in January 1959, a few weeks after the family disappeared, a man who was looking for traces of the family was searching a bluff near the Dalles Dam. He found tire tracks in the dirt that led off the bluff. There were also some white paint chips found on a rock near the tire tracks. It looked like a vehicle had either driven over or was pushed over the bluff into the Columbia River. Then, weeks later, on January 18th, a handgun was found under a rock in Cascade Locks. The butt of the gun was damaged and it was covered in blood. Someone who saw the gun thought it looked like it had been used to club something or someone to death. The serial number of the gun had been filed off. The lead detective on the case, Walter Graven, was able to trace the gun back to a sporting goods store in Portland. In September 1955, an employee had been accused of stealing about $2,000 worth of merchandise and the gun was one of the items he was accused of stealing. When the employee was confronted about the theft, he admitted that he stole the items. The employee was Donald Martin, the eldest of the Martin children. It turned out that Donald had a strained relationship with his family. He said that it stemmed from the fact that he was gay and his parents did not accept his lifestyle. 
He also said that his parents were fat slobs and his sisters were going to turn out just like them. In May 1959, about six months after the Martins disappeared, a tugboat was in the area where the tire tracks were found on the bluff. They dropped a two-ton anchor and they heard it hit something that was metal. They looked and on the floor of the river there was an object that was about the size of a car. Then they saw what they thought were clothes rise to the surface and then the clothes were taken away with the current. A scuba diver was sent into the river where the tugboat operators thought that the car was located. But the scuba diver nearly died, so the search was called off. Days later, on May 4th, 1959, some men working on a tugboat near Camas, Washington, found the body of a young girl floating in the Columbia River. It turned out to be the body of the youngest Martin, Susan. The next day, floating in a spillway about 25 miles from Susan's body, the body of another young girl was found. Her body was found near Cascade Locks, which is where the family got gas. With the help of dental records, the body was identified as Virginia, the second youngest, Martin. The medical examiner said that the cause of death for both girls was drowning. But this ruling is inaccurate. For drowning to be the official cause of death, all other causes of death needed to be ruled out. This couldn't happen because of the state of the remains. Drowning was put down as the cause of death because it was the most probable cause of death since the girls were found in the river. A sheriff's deputy who photographed the bodies noted that both girls had identical holes in their heads above and behind their right ears. The medical examiner was able to examine the stomach contents of both girls. Within two hours of their deaths, they had eaten burgers and fries. This seemed to verify the witnesses' accounts that the family had stopped for dinner in Hood River. The lead detective on the case, Walter Graven, noted that witnesses said that two ex-convicts, Roy Light and Lesser Price, were also in the restaurant when the family was there. They left the restaurant around the same time as the family. A stolen car that was driven by the two men was found abandoned in Cascade Logs after the family disappeared. The car was parked a short distance away from where the gun was found. Detective Graven knew that Donald could not have killed his family because he was over 3,000 miles away when they disappeared. Detective Graven did suspect that Donald had them arranged to be killed. Not only did Donald not like his family, but with all of them dead, he was the sole inheritor of their estate. Donald Mern came back to the area for the first time in June 1959 over seven months after his family went missing. He had planned on attending the memorial service for his sisters, but there was apparently a scheduling problem and he arrived in Portland the day after the service. Detective Graven questioned Donald and he could not think of anyone who would want to hurt his family. He also couldn't see how his father could have accidentally driven off a cliff. Detective Graven wrote a report about everything he had found, and he concluded that the family most likely met with foul play. But his superiors were not convinced. They thought that the Martins had just died in a tragic accident, and they decided to close the case. Don Mern was never charged in connection with the deaths of his sisters and the disappearances of his parents and his third sister. Donald Martin died at the age of 66 in July 2003. If he was involved in the murders of his family, he took that secret to the grave with him. The bodies of Kenneth Martin, his wife Barbara, and their daughter Barbie 
have never been found. It's assumed that they are deceased. Number one, the Solomons. In 1970, Saul Solomon immigrated from Israel to Los Angeles, California. He was 23 years old and he had been a commando in the Israeli army. After he relocated to Los Angeles, he drove a taxi. He eventually got a job selling encyclopedias. A year after Saul moved to Los Angeles, he was in a bar in Hollywood and he met 28-year-old Elaine Marlowitz. Elaine worked as a beautician. Not too long ago, she had divorced her husband after seven years of marriage. Elaine had a daughter from the marriage, three-year-old Michelle. After that initial meeting, Elaine and Saul started dating. A year later, they were married. A year after that, Elaine gave birth to a son, Mitchell. Saul eventually became a naturalized citizen. He also started his own company that refilled fire extinguishers. The business was successful, and in 1987, the family bought a house in Northridge, California. The family liked to spend their money. They dined at fine restaurants, and they always had the newest gadgets. They also owned a Mercedes-Benz and a Rolls-Royce. In the autumn of 1982, by most appearances, things were going well for the family. Saul was 35 years old and his business was doing well. His wife, Elaine, was 39 years old, his stepdaughter, Michelle, was 15, and his son, Mitchell, was 9. On October 12, 1982, Saul left the family's home, supposedly to go to a car auction with a man named Harvey Rader. Rader, who had moved to the United States from England, owned a car dealership called Mr. Motor. Hours later, Saul had not returned home. Around 11.30 p.m., Elaine was on the phone with a friend. The doorbell rang and Elaine told her friend that Harvey was at the door. She then hung up the phone. The next day, the neighbor who lived behind the Solomons called a family who lived on their street. She said that the Solomons pool was overflowing and flooding her backyard. She did not know the Solomons, but the family she was calling did know them. She wanted them to go talk to the Solomons. So they made their way over and found no one home. The family owned three vehicles, a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes Benz, and a white work van that Saul used for his business. The Mercedes and the van were parked in the driveway, but the Rolls Royce was gone. The doors were all locked and there were no lights on in the house. They went around to the backyard, and the pool was indeed flooding. The family's garden hose was on, and it was in the pool. The family's dog was also tied up in the backyard. The neighbors thought that the scene was strange. They went home and called some mutual friends and neighbors. No one had seen or heard from any of the Solomons that day. Elaine volunteered at a clinic and she didn't show up or call to say that she wasn't coming in. Michelle and Mitchell also didn't attend school that day. The neighbors decided to call the police. The police arrived at the family's home and they found no signs of a break-in or forced entry. When they got inside the home and started searching, they were disturbed by what they found. In 15-year-old Michelle's bedroom, the bed was broken and some bedding was missing. There were also some bloodstains on the wall. 
Later, the chief of police was asked how much blood was found. He said it was more blood than he would want to lose. A piece of the carpet in Melissa's bedroom had been cut out and a bath mat had been placed over it. A baseball bat was also found near the family's bar. One thing that the police noted was that all the beds were made. Several people who knew the family thought that this was incredibly odd because the family never made their beds. Because of what they found in the home, the police suspected that the family had been victims of foul play. Four days later, a road worker found some personal belongings of the family scattered along a freeway near Acton, California. This included family photos, their wallets, and their passports. There was some speculation that the family was killed by the Israeli Mafia. There were also rumors that Saul might have been involved in the sale of illegal firearms. But it wasn't long before the police began to suspect that Harvey Raider might have been involved in the family's disappearance. It turned out that Saul had invested $20,000 into Raider's business, Mr. Motor. Also, the family's missing Rolls Royce was found in Raider's possession. Raider was interviewed by the police. He denied that Saul had invested money with him. He also said he had no idea what happened to the family. Raider did admit they saw some of the family members on the day they went missing. He said they had picked up Saul at his home at 6 o'clock that evening and he had taken him to a car auction. Afterward, he drops Saul off at an Israeli restaurant. Raider said that after that, he went over to Saul's house to pick up the Rolls Royce because he had to do some maintenance on it. That was why he had it in his possession. Raider said that when he got to the Solomon's home, he said hello to Elaine, but when he left in the Rolls Royce, she was alive and well. The police investigated Raider's story and they found several problems with it. First, Raider said they picked up Saul at 6 p.m. and then they went to the auction. But the police checked and the auction ended at 5 p.m. Afterward, Raider said he dropped Saul off at an Israeli restaurant. It turned out that the restaurant was closed that night. The police were already familiar with Harvey Raider. In fact, Saul and his family were not the only people who had business dealings with Harvey Raider who went missing in 1982. Raider moved to the United States from England in 1978. He first lived in California, San Fernando Valley with another man who had also moved from England to the United States. They lived together for about six months. The roommate worked as a chauffeur for a sheik. In January 1980, the sheik's mansion in Beverly Hills caught fire and arson was suspected. Specifically, the police thought that Raider and his roommates started the fire to cover up the theft of some artwork. Raider was not charged with anything, but his roommate was. The roommate ended up pleading guilty to grand theft. In a civil trial that followed the conviction, Raider admitted that he had helped his roommate in the burglary. An art dealer was charged with buying some of the sheik's stolen artwork. Raider was granted immunity to testify against the art dealer. At the trial, the art dealer testified that he asked Raider where he got the artwork from and Raider told him it had been stolen. After the trials, Raider started his own business, Mr. Motor, which sold and repaired foreign cars. One of his clients was 54-year-old Peter Davis. 
Peter had also immigrated from England. By most appearances, Peter was a used car and antique dealer. He bought and sold luxury cars with Raider. But Peter was also involved in some shady business, like dealing in stolen artwork. He was also apparently involved in the sale of stolen guns and jewelry. On May 17, 1982, Peter and his 47-year-old wife, Joan Davis, went missing. When the police got inside their home, they found dinner was still cooking on the stove. The Davis's car was later found abandoned at the airport. Friends of the couple noticed that a valuable painting was missing from their home. The police decided to talk to the man who lived in the house next door to the Davises. The Davises also owned that home and the man who lived there rented from them. The man's name was Ashley Paul. Paul was Harvey Raider's cousin. Paul had worked as a salesman for Peter, but he had quit to work for his cousin. Paul told the police that on the day the Davises went missing, he had dropped Peter off at home. The police determined that Paul was the last person to see Peter Davis before he went missing. The police had Ashley Paul take a polygraph exam. He denied having any knowledge about what happened to the Davises. The polygraph examiner determined that he was being deceptive. But after the polygraph exam, Paul and his cousin, Raider, stopped cooperating with the police. But seven months later, the Solomons went missing and Raider was the last person to see them. While the police thought that Paul and Raider may have been involved in the disappearance of six people, they could not prove anything. So their investigation stalled. Ashley Paul then moved back to his native England. Elaine Solomon's mother was frustrated with the police investigation, so she hired a private detective. The private detective traveled to England several times and encouraged Ashley Paul to confess to his part in the disappearances. But Paul refused to divulge any information. Then a detective with the LAPD flew out to England and talked to Paul. Once again, Paul denied knowing anything about the disappearance. Then in November 1983, just over a year after the Solomons went missing, Paul went to Scotland Yard and started talking to a detective. At first, Paul only admitted that he was present during the murders of Peter Davis and Saul Solomon. He said that his cousin, Harvey Raider, had shot them both in the head. He claimed he did not know that his cousin was going to kill the two men. Paul did not explain what happened to the women and children. The Scotland Yard detective talked to the LAPD detective and told him what Paul had said. The district attorney granted Paul immunity in exchange for the truth about what happened to the Solomons and the Davises. For the next three days, Paul talked to the Scotland Yard detective and told him about the murders of the Davises and the Solomons. He said that they went over to the Davises home because his cousin wanted to look at a Corvette that Peter had in his possession. Paul explained that he was shocked when his cousin shot Peter in the head. Paul said that after Raider shot Peter, he started walking home which was next door to the Davises' home. Along the way, he passed Joan Davis and said nothing to her. Paul said the next day, he helped Raider bury the bodies next to Interstate 5. He said that seven months later, when Saul Solomon was killed, he was with his cousin, another car dealer, and two Italian men whose names he didn't know. Once again, his cousin surprised him by shooting Saul in the head. 
They put Saul's body into the trunk of the Royals Royce. After the murder, the other car dealer went home. Paul said that he, Raider, and the two Italian men went to the Solomon home. When they got there, Raider went into the house alone. Fifteen minutes later, he came back outside. Then Raider had the two Italian men go inside the house with him. Then Raider and the two men came outside with the three bodies wrapped in blankets. They placed the bodies in the trunk of the car. Raider went back into the home for a third time and stole some items. He also took a receipt and he was apparently quite happy that he had found it. The police think that the receipt is the one Raider wrote out for Saul for Saul's investment in his business. Paul claimed that the next day he watched Raider and the two Italian men bury the bodies off an interstate near Acton, California. Acton is close to where the family's wallets and passports were found. Paul also told the detectives that his cousin had committed a seventh murder. He said he had killed 27-year-old businessman Ronald Deeb. In January 1982, about four months before the Davises went missing, Adiba told his family he was going to meet a man to discuss some luxury foreign cars. Ronald Adib was never seen again. The police learned that, like Saul Solomon, Adib had invested money with Raider. The police concluded that Saul and Adib may have asked for their money back and Raider either didn't have the money or didn't want to give it back to them, so he killed them instead. Raider then killed Saul's family because he considered them witnesses. After confessing, Ashley Paul voluntarily traveled back to the United States. When he did, his cousin, Harvey Raider, was arrested. The police drove Paul out to the places where he said the bodies were buried but they did not find any human remains. However, Paul did lead them to an area where some bed sheets were buried. Friends and family of the Solomon were shown the bed sheets and they said that it might have come from the family's home. The bed sheets were the only items of interest that were found. Although Ashley Paul had been granted immunity, the district attorney decided to revoke the immunity and charge him with the murders of the family. They revoked it because they did not think that Paul was telling them the truth. They also released Raider from custody. Paul then told the police a news story regarding the disappearances. He admitted that he knew beforehand that his cousin was going to kill Peter Davis and the Solomons. He also said that he was in the Solomon home on the night of the murders. He admitted that he lied about the other auto dealer and the two Italian men being present during the murders. He said that he and Raider worked alone. Raider had ordered him to collect valuables in a garbage bag. Paul said that Harvey killed Elaine by hitting her head into the family's marble top bar. He then bludgeoned Mitchell with a baseball bat and he strangled Michelle. A judge later dismissed the charges against Paul because his immunity had been improperly revoked. After that, Ashley Paul went back to England and he never returned to the United States. His current whereabouts are unknown. Without Paul, there was not much of a case against Raider. The police could not even prove that the Davises, the Solomons, and Ronald D. were dead. In December 1986, Harvey Raider was deported. When he immigrated to the United States, he said he did not have a criminal record but he actually had 13 convictions, 
including theft, possession of a firearm, and stealing a motor vehicle. Months later, Raider illegally re-entered the United States and he tried to get a fake passport. Raider was arrested and in August 1987, he pleaded guilty to making a false passport application. He was sentenced to two years and nine months in a federal penitentiary. Then in August 1988, just after Harvey Raider was released from prison, he was charged with the murders of the Solomons. His trial started in May 1989. All the evidence against him was circumstantial. The trial lasted for two months. The jury deliberated for three and a half weeks, but they could not come to a unanimous decision. The vote was deadlocked at 11 to 1 to convict. The judge declared a mistrial. Harvey Rader went to trial again in January 1990. The star witness for the prosecution was another auto dealer who had been in one of Rader's cars after the Solomons disappeared and he said he saw a blood stain in the car. However, the judge discovered that the witness was facing a drunk driving charge and Rader's defense lawyer was representing him in that case. The judge considered this to be a conflict of interest, so he declared a mistrial a day after the trial began. Harvey Rader went to trial for the murders of the Solomon for a third time in May 1992. The trial lasted for two months. Once again, there was no physical evidence that Rader murdered the family. Their remains had not been found so there was no evidence that they were even dead. The jury deliberated for two days. They ultimately found Raider not guilty on all charges. It's unclear what happened to Harvey Raider after the trial. Anyone who associated with him during his trials has lost contact with him. His current whereabouts are unknown. The whereabouts of Ronald Adib, the Davises, and the Solomons are also a mystery. Many people, particularly those who worked on the case, think that Harvey Rader got away with seven murders. Number 3. Tyler Peterson Crandon is a small town in northeast Wisconsin. In 2007, it had a population of just under 2,000. 18-year-old Jordan Murray lived in a duplex in the small town. On the night of October 8, 2007, she was hosting a pizza and movie party. At about 2.30 a.m., there were six party guests, 18-year-old Katrina McCorkle, 17-year-old Leanna Thomas, 20-year-old Bradley Schultz, 20-year-old Aaron Smith, 14-year-old Lindsay Stahl, and 21-year-old Charlie Netzel. Around 2.30 is the time that Murray's ex-boyfriend, 20-year-old Tyler Peterson, arrived at the party. Peterson was a full-time police officer with the Crandon Police Department and a part-time sheriff's deputy with Forest County. At the time, Peterson was off duty. Peterson really wanted to reconcile with Murray but Murray didn't want to get back together with Peterson, and they argued. Then the other partygoers started taunting Peterson by calling him a worthless pig. Peterson stormed out of the party and went out to his truck. He picked up his police-issued AR-15 rifle, walked back to the duplex, and kicked in the door. He then methodically hunted down every party member. A police officer happened to be in the area and he heard the gunshots. He drove over to the duplex. About five minutes after Peterson went into the duplex, he stepped outside and opened fire on the police car. He then got into his pickup truck and drove away. The responding police officer was uninjured, but his windshield was destroyed, so he couldn't pursue Peterson. Instead, he called paramedics to the area 
he alerted his fellow officers that Peterson had shot up a party. Police officers and sheriff's deputies searched throughout the night for Peterson. Peterson did something bold and radioed in to the sheriff's office, posing as another deputy, and gave false information about what type of truck he was driving. Peterson ended up driving to a cabin in Argonne, Wisconsin, which is a town about 8 miles from the scene of the shooting. His friends were in the cabin and they led him inside. They noticed that he seemed intoxicated. He admitted to them that he had shot the people at the party. Around 10 a.m., someone inside the cabin called the police and told them that Peterson was there. Police officers and deputies surrounded the cabin. At around 12.30, Peterson left the cabin and walked quickly towards the woods. Just before he was able to slip into the woods, a sniper fired a shot at him. It hit him in the left bicep. The police pursued Peterson into the woods. A short time later, they found 20-year-old Tyler Peterson dead. He had managed to shoot himself in the head three times. Out of the seven people at the party, six of them had died. The only survivor was 21-year-old Charlie Netzel, who had been shot three times. He survived because he had played dead. The mass murder shocked the small town and made headlines across the country. Eight months after the shooting, the duplex where the shooting took place was torn down. Number 2. David Chippa Metiana Krugersdorp is a city in South Africa that is just west of Johannesburg. In 2003, 42-year-old David Metiana, who went by the name Chippa, was a respected police officer in the city. But on April 3, 2006, something in his mind snapped. Supposedly, he was mad that his eight-year relationship with his girlfriend, 48-year-old Poppy Mosea, had ended. Chippa had been jealous, and he thought that Poppy was having affairs with other police officers. Perhaps, that's why he started his horrible killing spree at her home. Chippa shot 48-year-old Poppy, her 24-year-old daughter, Loreo Mazea, her 21-year-old niece, Deneo Mubi, her 21-year-old cousin, Mazabada Mubi, and perhaps, most tragically, her 18-month-old grandson, Labogang Mosea. Only Poppy's cousin, Masaba Mubi, survived, and she called for help. But Chippa was already heading to the police station. When he got there, he started shooting his fellow police officers. He shot 38-year-old Captain David Masipa in the chest. He pumped several bullets into the pelvis of 42-year-old Senior Superintendent Mishak Zondo. He shot 42-year-old Captain Jabulani Sokaela in the head. Finally, he shot 40-year-old Captain Franz Monoma in the head and the chest. All four police officers died in the police station. After killing his four fellow police officers, Chippa drove to the home of his 44-year-old brother, Abraham Metama. He shot Abraham in the neck. After shooting his brother, Chippa drove away. But soon, the police were on his tail and there was a high-speed chase. During the chase, a 44-year-old pedestrian, Patrick Zulio Sol, was run down and killed. About eight hours after Chippa started his murderous spree, his fellow officers, who had not been shot to death, surrounded him. 42-year-old David Chippa Metiana then shot himself in the head. Including Chippa, his spree left 10 people dead. His brother survived, but he was paralyzed. Chippa didn't leave a suicide note, but he did take the time to write a message on a computer at his former girlfriend's house. It reads, I am not to blame. I am important. I deserve to be loved by you. I deserve to be treated with respect, and I will still love you forever. Number 1. Wubong Kun In April 1982, Wubong Kun was 27 years old 
and he was a police officer in Yeryong County, South Korea. He lived with his girlfriend, 27-year-old Chun Mao Sun Wu, a former Marine, was described as hard drinking and rude. His superior supposedly knew about his drinking problem and that is why he was assigned to the countryside. On the afternoon of April 26, 1982, Wu was napping before he had to go on duty. His girlfriend noticed that there was a fly on his chest, so she tried to swat it off. When she did, she woke Wu up, and he was not in a good mood. Wu and Sean started arguing. He then left their home and went to the armory of the police station. He grabbed two carbine rifles, 180 rounds of ammunition, and seven hand grenades. He went back home, and he started drinking. He then smashed the furniture in his home and beat up his girlfriend. Afterward, he walked out and started firing his gun at people. Shun Mao's son stepped outside and saw that Wu was shooting people, and then he shot her, and she lost consciousness. One of Wu's first stops was the post office, where he killed the telephone operators, who were the only ones who could call for help. Wu would then knock on the door of random houses and murder whoever opened the door. Other times, he would get into the home and wipe out entire families. One family of four was holding a wake for a loved one, and Wu killed all four family members. In one encounter, Wu had an 18 year old student. Kim Zhu Dong as a hostage. He went to his store and asked the store owner for a soft drink. The owner, Shin Wee Du, gave Wu a soft drink and he took a sip. After taking a drink, Wu executed the 18 year old student. Wu then opened fire on Shin and his family. Shin was shot in the leg and he survived. His 51 year old wife and his two daughters, who were 13 and 9, were all shot to death. Throughout the rest of the night, Wu traveled to three other villages and killed people at random. About eight hours after he started his massacre, he broke into a farmhouse belonging to 68-year-old Xu and Su. Wu told Xu that he was hunting a communist and he asked Xu to get his family to surround him. The police and army personnel learned that Wu was in the farmhouse and they surrounded it. Just as they were about to breach the house, Wu detonated two grenades. He was killed along with three of Xu and Xu's family, but Xu and Xu survived. Tragically, over eight hours, Wu Bum Kun killed 57 people, including himself. 36 more people were injured. His victims were men, women, and children. They ranged in age from 2 years old to 71 years old. Notably, Wu's girlfriend survived her injuries. When Wu was found, out of the 180 rounds and 7 hand grenades he took, he only had 4 rounds and 2 grenades left. For decades, Wu Bong Kun's rampage was the deadliest mass murder committed by a lone gunman. The Markov record was broken in July 2011 when Anders Braring Breivik shot to death 69 people and killed another 8 with a car bomb in Norway. Number 3. Carl Ryman The Pine Village Steakhouse was a restaurant slash tavern on the outskirts of Yorkville, Illinois. On the evening of December 29, 1972, there were three employees in the restaurant and two patrons. Suddenly, a man armed with a gun and a woman came into the restaurant. The man rounded up everyone in the restaurant and the woman emptied the cash register. During the robbery, a family walked in. The man with the gun told them he wouldn't hurt them if they sat down and didn't make any trouble. Once the woman had gathered up all the money lead to have been about $500, the man started executing the people who were in the restaurant when they came in. He went to shoot the family, but he had run out of ammunition. 
The shooter and his accomplice fled the restaurant and sped off in their car. Help was called for, but sadly, nothing could be done for the people who were shot. 74-year-old cook George Prasad, 48-year-old bartender John Wilson, 16-year-old dishwasher Catherine Riquet, and 35-year-old patron David Gardner were all shot in the head. 48-year-old Robert Loftus was shot twice in the torso. Only the bartender, John Wilson, was taken to the hospital. The other four were pronounced dead at the restaurant. Tragically, Wilson died later that night in the hospital. The witnesses were able to give a description of the car and the couple. About 40 minutes after the deadly robbery, 31-year-old Carl Ryman and 30-year-old Betty Pitch were arrested. They went to trial together in May 1973. Ryman's lawyer argued that he was insane at the time of the massacre because why else would someone kill five people? Ryman's lawyer also pointed out that Ryman had suffered three head injuries as a child and as a result, he had suffered permanent brain damage. Pitch's lawyer said that it wasn't her fault that Ryman was a mentally ill man who killed five people. The prosecution argued that just because a crime didn't make sense or it isn't something an average person would do, it does not mean Ryman wasn't responsible for his actions. The prosecution also argued that Pitch was a willing participant in the crime. During the robbery, she made several sarcastic remarks and then tried to escape from Ryman after he slaughtered five people. The trial lasted five days. It took the jury six hours to reach a verdict. Both Ryman and Pitch were found guilty on all counts. Betty Pitch was sentenced to 20 to 60 years in prison and she was eligible to apply for parole after 11 years. For each of the murder charges, Ryman was sentenced to 50 to 100 years in prison. He was eligible to apply for parole after 20 years. Betty Pitch was paroled in 1983 and she died in 2004. In the mid-1980s, Carl Ryman had significant religious conversion and has shown remorse for his actions ever since. He also started working in the hospice of the prison and he worked there for decades. Ryman also suffered major health issues in prison. He had cancer three times. As a result, he only has vision in one eye. He also suffered a stroke. In 2020, he had congestive heart failure. Carl Ryman served nearly 45 years in prison, which is about 9 years for every life he took. He ended up applying for parole 20 times. He was paroled in April 2018 at the age of 77. Some family members of the victims were outraged. Bruce Riquet is the brother of 16-year-old Catherine Riquet, who was killed in the robbery. Catherine had only been working at the restaurant for a few weeks before she was killed. Bruce told a reporter, Five victims never got to be free no more. They don't get to walk this earth. Why should this man? Upon his release, Ryman moved around a lot and didn't keep the authorities informed as to where he was. So he was sent back to prison. He was released in July 2019. In July 2020, a reporter with WSPY News interviewed Ryman, who was living in Chicago's South Side. Ryman said that there was nothing he could do to take back what he did. He also said he would gladly give his life for each one of their lives if he could. Ryman said that outside of prison, he has tried to help people in the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago. Carl Ryman has stayed out of the news since the interview. At the time of this video, he is 80 years old. An interesting but tragic note to this story is that Carl Ryman isn't the only killer in his family. On August 24th, 1986, 41-year-old Sharon Rollins lived in DeKalb, Illinois, 
was found murdered. She had been sexually assaulted, beat, and stabbed to death with a screwdriver. Ryman's 19-year-old son, Matthew Ryman, was a neighbor of Roland's. After the murder, Matthew confessed to his mother. His mother turned him in and he was arrested. In December 1987, Matthew Ryman pleaded guilty to murder. He was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. He is currently serving his sentence at the Pinckneyville Correctional Center in Pinckneyville, Illinois. Number 2. Mitchell Johnson In the spring of 1998, 13-year-old Mitchell Johnson and 11-year-old Andrew Golden were attending Westside Middle School in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Johnson and Golden became friends on the school bus, but they weren't close friends. Johnson was born in Minnesota in August 1984. His mother moved him and his brother to Jonesboro when he was seven after she divorced their father. In Jonesboro, she worked as a prison guard. She ended up marrying an inmate. Johnson apparently had a good relationship with his stepfather. Johnson was considered polite by the adults who knew him. He attended church regularly and he was a member of the choir. But Johnson wasn't trouble free. In the summer of 1997, when he was 12, he was visiting some family in Minnesota. He was caught sexually abusing a girl who was two or three years old. He was arrested. He had two court appearances. In the spring of 1998, he was still awaiting trial. Andrew Golden was born in May 1986 in Jonesboro. He lived in a stable household. Both of his parents were postal workers. Despite having a stable home life, Golden had behavioral problems. Many people described him as a bully. He had gotten into several fist fights with other kids. He talked to some kids about wanting to smoke marijuana and join the street gang, the Bloods. He also told people he had a lot of killing to do. Golden grew up around firearms and he received his first gun when he was six years old. He had won several marksman competitions. As the winter of 1998 was drawing to an end, both boys were angry because they had been dating girls who broke up with them. Johnson had been dating an 11 year old girl named Kim Candace Porter and Golden had been dating 12 year old Jennifer Jacobs. Starting in February 1998, the boys started hoarding guns. The Golden family kept most of their guns in a safe. The boys tried to break into the safe with a hammer and a blowtorch, but they couldn't get it open. They did manage to get three handguns that weren't locked up. They also broke into the basement of Golden's grandfather and stole seven more guns, including a rifle and a carbine. They also stole over a thousand rounds of ammunition. On the evening of March 23, 1998, the boys loaded the guns and the ammo into Johnson's mother's van. They also put in some camping gear, snack foods, and several stuffed animals. Then they went to bed. The next morning, Johnson took his mother's keys, got on the van, and drove with Golden to the school. Behind the school, there was a wooded area. The boys parked the van in the wooded area. The wooded area was on an elevated piece of land that overlooked the school. Then the boys went to an area near the woods where they could see the school. Johnson stayed there and Golden made his way to the school. Inside the school, at around 12.30 p.m., Golden pulled the fire alarm. He then ran back outside and joined Johnson. Then, when the classes started filing out, 13-year-old Johnson and 11-year-old Golden opened fire. Unfortunately, the fire alarm system caused the doors to lock once they were closed behind the students. So many of them were trapped. 
One teacher, 32-year-old Shannon Wright, stepped in front of a 6th grade girl and she was shot twice. The girl that she shielded was not injured. Another teacher, 42-year-old Lynette Thetford, also shielded students and she was shot as well. Within 4 minutes, 27 shots were fired. Two teachers and 13 students were shot. Four students, 11-year-old Natalie Brooks, 12-year-old Paige Ann Herring, 12-year-old Stephanie Johnson, and 11-year-old Brittany Rachel Vanner, and one teacher, 32-year-old Shannon Wright, all died as a result of their wounds. Johnson and Golden has specifically targeted girls. Out of the 15 people who were shot, only one boy was shot. Among the injured were Kim Candace Porter and Jennifer Johnson, who had dated the boys. After the shooting, the boys ran towards the van, but the police apprehended them before they could get there. The boys were asked why they did it, and Johnson said it was Golden's idea. He had asked him if he wanted to do it, and he said sure. When Johnson was specifically asked why, he said, anger I guess. Four months after the shooting, on August 11, 1998, which was Mitchell Johnson's 14th birthday, he pleaded guilty to five counts of murder. At the hearing, he claimed he never intended to kill anyone. He said that they were just planning on shooting over everyone's head. Andrew Golden, who had turned 12 since the shooting, had his trial that same day. It lasted three hours, and the judge found him guilty. Since the boys were under the age of 14 when they committed the murders, they couldn't be sentenced as adults. So they could only be incarcerated until the age of 21. Then, once they were released, they would have a clean record. The next year, Arkansas created a new law so that someone under the age of 14 who commits a crime like murder can be tried and sentenced as if they were an adult. Mitchell Johnson was released in August 2005 after serving just over seven years. Andrew Golden was released in May 2007. He had been incarcerated for about nine years. Johnson continued to get into problems after he was released. On New Year's Day 2007, Johnson was arrested at a traffic stop. He had 21 grams of marijuana on him and he was in possession of a loaded 9mm handgun. He was charged with possession of a firearm while either using or addicted to a controlled substance. It was an obscure charge that is rarely used. Johnson's lawyer believed he was charged with a rare crime because people were still upset that he was involved in the murders of five people, including four children, and he had only served seven years. In January 2008, he was found guilty. He remained free while he awaited his sentencing hearing. Just a few days after he was convicted, he was arrested again. He was working at a gas station, and a customer left behind a credit card. Johnson used the credit card to buy some food at Burger King. When he was arrested for stealing the credit card, he had some marijuana on him, so he was charged with possession. In September 2008, 24-year-old Mitchell Johnson was sentenced to four years in prison for possession of a firearm while either using or addicted to a controlled substance. In October 2008, he pleaded guilty to stealing the credit card having marijuana on him. The following month, for those convictions, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. In February 2009, he pleaded guilty to theft by receiving and financial identity fraud because he had used the credit card at Burger King. He was sentenced to an additional 6 years in prison. In total, he had been sentenced to 22 years in prison. He ended up staying in prison for about seven years. In July 2015, he was placed in a drug rehabilitation program and he has stayed out of the news ever since. His current whereabouts are unknown. After Andrew Golden was released, he legally changed his name to Drew Grant. The fact that he changed his name became public in 2008 because he applied for a concealed carry permit. 
he was ultimately denied. On the evening of July 27, 2019, 33-year-old Drew Grant was driving on the highway near Cave City, Arkansas with his 29-year-old wife and 2-year-old child. 59-year-old Daniel Petty was driving in the opposite lane. Petty crossed over the median and collided head-on with Grant and his family. Both Grant and Petty were killed in the collision. According to ABC News, Mitchell Johnson is the only living U.S. mass shooter who is not incarcerated. Number 1. Christopher Thomas In April 1984, 34-year-old Enrique Bermudez was living with his 24-year-old girlfriend, Virginia Lopez, in East New York, which is a Brooklyn neighborhood. Virginia was six months pregnant. Also living in the house were Enrique's two daughters, 14-year-old Betsy and 10-year-old Marilyn, and Virginia's two sons, 4-year-old Juan and 7-year-old Eddie. Enrique made his money by dealing cocaine. In 1984, April 15th was Palm Sunday, which is the day before Easter. That afternoon, Enrique went out and his family stayed home. When he returned home a few hours later, he was shocked by what he found. He called 911. The veteran homicide detectives who responded were also shocked by the scene. They described the house as eerily quiet. While Enrique was out, Virginia's 20-year-old cousin, Carmen Perez, and her three children, 5-year-old Alberto, 3-year-old Noel, and 11-month-old Christina, came over for a visit. Also visiting was Carmen's sister, 14-year-old Magdalia Perez, and their cousin, 10-year-old Maria Perez. Enrique's two daughters were home, as were Virginia's two sons. It appeared that the two women and nine children were all watching TV. Then someone, or possibly several people, got into the home and started shooting. Ten of the eleven women and children were shot to death. Only 11-month-old Christina was unharmed. It was determined that 19 bullets from two handguns were fired. One gun was a 22 caliber and the other was a 38 caliber. Initially, the police thought that there were two shooters which would explain the two guns. Also, all the victims were killed in rapid succession. It appeared that none of them had a chance to react or move once the shooting started. The police quickly developed a theory regarding motive. They thought that the murders were drug-related since Enrique Bermudez was a drug dealer. Even by the standards of New York City in 1984, where there was an average of five murders per day, the Palm Sunday Massacre was shocking because of its level of brutality. So the police thought that the murders were committed by, or performed on behalf of, a Colombian drug cartel. But beyond that, the police didn't have any leads. A month went by and no arrests were made in the case. Then in the middle of May 1984, about a month after the mass murder, the police received several tips. They all said that a 34-year-old drug addict with a history of violence named Christopher Thomas might be responsible. Thomas's first significant brush with the law was in the winter of 1981. On November 1st, his 24-year-old girlfriend, Carol Epps, was found strangled to death in a shower in a motel room in Fort Lee, New Jersey. The medical examiner believed that she was killed the day before. On December 14, 1981, Thomas was arrested for the murder. He went to trial in June 1982. The case against him was circumstantial. The night manager at the motel picked him out of a photo lineup. Also, Thomas's fingerprints were found on the registration card but his fingerprints had not been found in the motel room. It was a six-day trial, and the jury deliberated for four hours. Thomas was acquitted. The jurors said that while the prosecutor may have placed him at the motel, they couldn't prove he killed Epps. 
Then, five days before the Palm Sunday Massacre, Thomas broke into the home of his estranged wife. He then proceeded to viciously beat her. After getting the tips, the police thought that Christopher Thomas was a plausible suspect in the Palm Sunday Massacre. So on May 22nd, just over a month after the mass shooting, the police searched the home of Thomas's estranged wife. The investigators learned that Thomas used to like to shoot mice that ran around the home with a 22 caliber handgun. He left behind some shell casings and the police collected them. They were compared to the shell casings left at the scene of the massacre. Forensic experts determined that they were fired from the same gun. Fortunately, the police didn't have a hard time tracking down Thomas. He was in jail because he had been arrested for a horrifying crime. Some reports said that he had been arrested because he had sexually assaulted his mother and other reports said he had attempted to sexually assault his mother. Nevertheless, in June 1984, while he was in jail, he was charged with 10 murders. He went to trial 13 months later, in July 1985. The prosecutor said that Christopher Thomas went to the home of Enrique Bermudez for two reasons. First, Enrique had been his drug dealer, and they had argued several times over deals. At the time, Thomas owed Enrique $9,000. Also, Thomas incorrectly believed that Enrique was having an affair with his estranged wife. When Thomas got to Enrique's house and discovered he wasn't there, he killed nearly everyone else in the house instead. Thomas's lawyer didn't try to argue that he didn't kill the women and children. He just argued that Thomas was too messed up on drugs to know what he was doing. He was also in a bad emotional state because he was upset over the state of his marriage. The trial lasted a little over a week. Over three days, the jury deliberated for 16 hours. Then the jury foreman announced that Christopher Thomas was guilty of first-degree murder. But then the other jurors spoke up and the foreman corrected himself. They had actually acquitted Thomas of the 10 murders but they had found him guilty on 10 counts of manslaughter. The jury thought he was too intoxicated to be in the right frame of mind. In September 1985, Christopher Thomas was given the maximum of 8 and one third years to 25 years in prison. He was ordered to serve each sentence consecutively, so his sentence was 83 to 250 years in prison. But, according to New York state law at the time, an inmate could only serve a maximum of 50 years. He was also allowed to apply for parole after serving two-thirds of his sentence, which was 33 years. More time also could have been taken off for good behavior. So Thomas was able to apply for parole for the first time in May 2009 after serving 24 years. His request was denied. Over the next eight years, he applied for parole four more times, and then he was denied each time. Then, in January 2018, after serving 33 years in prison for the cold-blooded murders of two women and eight children, Christopher Thomas, who was 68, was released on parole. He will remain on parole until 2034. Since Thomas was released, he has stayed out of the news, and his current whereabouts are unknown. This story did have one small bright spot. One of the first officers to arrive on the scene in 1984 was Joanne Jaffe. When Jaffe arrived at the scene, the sole survivor of the massacre, 11-month-old Christina Perez, was handed over to her. Christina's mother and her two brothers were killed in the slaughter. Jaffe took Christina to the hospital and watched over her that night. Jaffe kept in contact with Christina as she grew up. When Christina was 14, she moved in with Jaffe and her husband. When Christina was in her late 20s, her grandmother, who was her legal guardian, passed away. So Jaffe decided to adopt her. In 2013, when Christina was 31 years old, 
the adoption process was completed and Jaffe was legally Christina's mother. Number three, George Stevenson, George Daly, and John Daly. In the 1920s, Joe Cleaver founded a publishing company, Cleaver Hume Press, in London, England. He was successful, and he and his wife ran in London's elite social circles. Joe and Hilda first met when they were 15 years old. They got married in 1928 after being engaged for nine years. One of Joe's dreams was to own a country house in the Fording Bridge, Hampshire area. He first fell in love with the area when he and Hilda would go fishing there in the early days of their marriage. Joe ended up building a house in the area. They called the house Brigade House. Joe and Hilda had two sons whom they raised in the house. Their sons moved out and Joe and Hilda grew all together in their dream house. At the end of summer 1986, Joe and Hilda were both 82 years old. Hilda was disabled, so they had a live-in nurse, 70-year-old Margaret Murphy. On the morning of September 2nd, 1986, the cleaner and the gardener arrived at the house. They found the house filled with smoke. They looked around, and in the bedroom, they found the dead body of a woman. It was the daughter-in-law of the Cleavers, 46-year-old Wendy Cleaver. Wendy was married to Joe and Hilda's son, Thomas Cleaver. The gardener and the cleaner tried to get into the master bedroom, but it was too hot. They went to phone for help, but they realized the phone line had been cut. So they got into a car and drove to the police station. In the master bedroom, the fire department found the charred remains of 82-year-old Joe and 82-year-old Hilda, their 47-year-old son, Thomas, and 7-year-old Margaret Murphy, the live-in nurse. They all had been bound, doused with gas, and set on fire. They were all alive when they were set on fire. It turned out that the fire had been contained to the master bedroom because concrete had been added to support the wooden beams. 47-year-old Wendy Cleaver had been raped and strangled to death with a piece of black ribbon. The police looked around and noted several things had been stolen. This included a TV, a video recorder, five guns, and ammunition. Also, about 90 pounds had been stolen. But the thieves missed 700 pounds hidden in Thomas's artificial leg. Thomas had lost his leg years earlier in a car crash. Pictures and paintings in the house were skewed, which suggested that someone was looking for a hidden safe. During their investigation, the police learned that Joe had fired a handyman, 35-year-old George Stevenson, about four weeks earlier. George had fired Stevenson because he was a drunk who beat his wife, who also worked at the home. Stevenson had a criminal record for burglary, fraud, and assaulting a police officer. The police went to interview George, and they discovered he was gone. He quickly became the most wanted man in England. During the manhunt, the police learned that he had rented a car on the day of the murders. 25-year-old George Daly had paid the deposit for the car. So the police arrested George Daly and his 21-year-old brother, John Daly. Stevenson surrendered two days after the bodies were found. He claimed he was innocent. He said he merely drove the Daly brothers to and from the Cleaver's home and he had no idea they had murdered anyone. George Daly denied being involved in the home invasion and mass murder. But John Daly was ready to talk. John explained that Stevenson knew that the Cleavers had guns. He wanted to steal them to use in a future armed robbery. Stevenson knew that the Cleavers kept a key hidden under the front porch. He got the key and they entered the home. They were armed with pickaxe handles. When they broke in, the family was sitting down for dinner. They were led upstairs and they were all bound. The three men searched the house for the guns and a safe, but they could not find the safe. 
The three men pulled Wendy into another bedroom and they took turns raping her. John said he went last. Stevenson came into his room and on a table he placed a knife and a length of ribbon. John said that he understood that Stevenson wanted him to kill Wendy. So he put her on her stomach and wrapped a cloth around her neck. He strangled her until she stopped breathing. Afterwards, Stevenson told George Daly that the other four were dead and he had poured gasoline on them. He told George to throw a lighter in the room. John said that his brother threw the lighter in because he thought that they were all dead. They wanted the entire house to burn down to hide any evidence that they had been there. George Stevenson, George Daly, and John Daly went to trial in October 1987. After a three-week trial, George Stevenson was found guilty of four murders. He was acquitted of killing Wendy. He was given six life sentences. He had to serve a minimum of 25 years before applying for parole. John Daly was found guilty of all five murders and he was given seven life sentences. His brother, George Daly, was found guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to 22 years in prison. In 2001, it was ordered that George Stevenson wouldn't be able to apply for parole after 35 years. In 2010, George Daly was released after serving his 22-year sentence. In March 2021, after serving 33 years, George Stevenson applied for parole. If he's granted parole, he'll be released in 2023. However, he'll be on a perpetual life license. That means if he does anything wrong, he'll immediately be sent back to prison. At the time of this video, George Stevenson is 70 years old and he is still in prison. George Daly is 60 years old and his current whereabouts are unknown. John Daly is 56 years old and it's believed that he is still in prison. After the brutal mass murder, no one wanted to buy Brigade House and it was eventually demolished. Number 2. Carl Brown Carl Robert Brown was born in Chicago, Illinois in November 1930. In the 1950s, he married a woman named Nancy Worthington. Nancy gave birth to two daughters, Susan and Anita. Carl was an ambitious man. He taught social studies at Hialeah Junior High School in Miami, Florida, but he felt like he didn't make enough money. He managed to purchase a group of low-rent apartments. He also taught business classes at the local college at night. In 1969, Carl and Nancy got divorced. Nancy wanted to get her PhD and Carl disapproved. A couple years later, Carl got married to a woman named Sylvia. Sylvia gave birth to a son, Andy. But the marriage didn't even last three years. Carl said that Sylvia wasn't committed to their home life. Sylvia said that Carl was mentally ill and he refused to get help. Many other people thought that Carl's personality had changed over the years. In the 1970s, many of his friends and co-workers would avoid him. For example, when he came into the staff room at school, other staff members left. When he talked to people, he ranted about politics and his anti-communist beliefs. Adults weren't the only ones to notice that Carl's behavior was becoming more erratic. Often, when he would talk to his students, he changed the subject in the middle of the sentence. Carl's two daughters tried to have him committed to a psychiatric hospital. He ended up disowning them. In the summer of 1981, Carl was transferred to Drew Middle School, which is also in Miami. His behavior became even more erratic. In March 1982, Carl was relieved of his teaching duties and he was sent for psychological treatment. During his sessions with a psychiatrist, he acted calmly. 
The psychiatrist thought that his rants were just the ramblings of a confused mind. He also didn't think that Carl was dangerous. But when Carl asked to go back to work, his request was denied. Neighbors thought that Carl was quiet but eccentric. People usually saw him riding his bike around the neighborhood, collecting cans. On August 18, 1982, Carl went to Morris Welding and Machine Services, Incorporated. He wanted a lawnmower motor repair to use it on his bike. The bill for the repair was $20. Carl started yelling at the business owner, Bob Moore, because he felt that shoddy work had been done on the engine. He was also unhappy that his traveler's check would not be accepted as payment. He then started incoherently ranting. What people in the shop did make out was that he said that Russia was the best country and he hated America. He said he was going to come back and kill all the Americans. He then left the shop. Moore and his employees just thought that Carl was a loud but harmless lunatic. Later that day, Carl took his 10-year-old son, Andy, to a gun store near his house. Carl purchased two shotguns and a rifle. The next morning, Carl got onto his bike. He told Andy he was going to kill a lot of people and asked him if he wanted to come. He said he was going to end up at Hialeah Junior High School, where he formerly worked. Andy refused to go. Carl set off on his bike with a shotgun slung over his shoulder. Around 11 a.m., Carl arrived at Moore's Welding and Machine Services, Incorporated. He entered a side door and walked into their office. He said he was going to send them back to Germany. He first killed the manager, 47-year-old Carl Lee, then he killed the bookkeeper, 78-year-old Manga Moore. He then shot to death the two secretaries, 29-year-old Martha Steelman and 67-year-old Ernestine Moore. The shop owner, Bob Moore, was not in the shop at the time of the shooting. Ernestine was his mother and Mangum was his uncle. 53-year-old crane operator Lonnie Jeffries happened to be in the office and he was shot as well. Jeffries died from his wounds. Carl then entered the machine shop. He shot 42-year-old machinist Carl Vanquist Sr. and his 17-year-old son Carlos Vanquist Jr. who helped at the shop. Carl also shot 30-year-old Eduardo Lima, a machinist. All three men survived. He then turned the gun on 38-year-old Juan Ramon Trepascios and killed him. Once he shot everyone in the machine room, he went to the welding room. He found 44-year-old Pedro Vasquez hiding and he shot him dead. 46-year-old welder Nelson Berrios tried to run and Carl Brown shot him in the parking lot. Carl then got on his bike and calmly rode away. People and neighboring businesses heard the gunshots. Ernest Hammond, who worked at a business across the road, ran after Carl as he rode away. Hammett then stopped at a shop that was owned by Mike Cram. Hammett told Cram that a man on a bike shot up Bob Moore's shop. Hammett and Cram got into Cram's 1981 Lincoln Continental and pursued Carl. Five blocks later, they came across him. Hammett aimed a gun at him and tried to fire a warning shot. The bullet hit Carl in the back, but he didn't act like he had been wounded. He started to reach for his gun to shoot back. So Cram hit Carl with his car. Carl and his bike slammed into a cement utility pole and he flew off his bike and stopped moving. Cram and Hammett stopped and were able to flag down a police officer. The police officer checked and 51 year old Carl Brown was dead. It turned out that the bullet hit Brown in the heart and he died from the gunshot and not from the crash. Brown's murder spree sparked over a $20 bill, left eight people dead and three people injured. 
It was called Miami's Worst Mass Murder. Mike Cram and Ernest Hammond were now charged with killing Carl. The authorities believe that their actions possibly saved more lives. Number 1. Patrick Purdy Patrick Purdy was born in November 1964 to Benjamin Purdy and Kathleen Toscano in Tacoma, Washington. Benjamin was a staff sergeant in the Army. When Patrick was two, Benjamin threatened Kathleen with a weapon, so she divorced him. Kathleen and Patrick ended up selling in Stockton, California. Patrick attended Cleveland Elementary School in Stockton, California from kindergarten until the second grade. Growing up, Patrick had mental health issues. He looked for ways to cope. He eventually turned to alcohol. By the time he was 14, he was an alcoholic. When he was 14, he was kicked out of his home after a violent fight with his mother. For a while, he lived on the streets of San Francisco, California. He was eventually put into a foster home and he was adopted. But by then, he was addicted to drugs. It wasn't long before he started committing crimes. Between 1980 and 1987, he developed a long criminal record which included marijuana possession, prostitution, vandalism, robbery, and receiving stolen property. In April 1987, Patrick was in the El Dorado National Forest. He was arrested for firing a semi-automatic pistol. All the crimes were minor, so he never did much time in jail. But when he was in jail, he attempted suicide twice. At some point, he was evaluated by a psychiatrist. He said that Patrick had a mild intellectual disability and he was a danger to himself. But then, in 1987, Patrick seemed to be getting his life together. He started taking welding classes at community college. But unfortunately, it didn't last long. He left California and started drifting. He ended up in Oregon, where he lived with his aunt and uncle. While living in Oregon, he purchased a Chinese-made AK-47 semi-automatic rifle at a gun shop. He could purchase the rifle because none of his convictions had barred him from gun ownership. Also, a psychiatric evaluation only said that he was a danger to himself, not others. At the end of summer 1987, Patrick left Oregon and moved back to Stockton, California. On January 17, 1989, 24-year-old Patrick Purdy armed himself with his AK-47 and two handguns. He drove his car towards Cleveland Elementary School, which was the school he attended from kindergarten to grade two. He parked his car not far from the school and then set it on fire. He then walked to the school. At the time, the students in grades one, two, and three were outside for recess. Without warning, Patrick Purdy sprayed the playground with bullets using the AK-47. He fired 105 shots. The students ran for cover. Then 24-year-old Patrick Purdy pulled out a handgun and he shot himself in the head. Tragically, 6-year-old Twee Tran, 6-year-old Sakaman, 8-year-old Ram Chun, 8-year-old Owen Lim, and 9-year-old Rathnar Orr were all killed. An additional 30 students and a teacher were also injured. Why Patrick Purdy chose to shoot up the school is something he took to the grave with him. The police believed it may have been race related. Most of the kids who were shot were of Vietnamese and Cambodian descent. Patrick often expressed racist views and one time when he was arrested he was carrying racist literature. But as to why he chose his former school instead of another location, we will probably never know. Number 3. The AMF Broadway Bowling Alley Murders Just after 11.30pm on January 27, 2002, 
three people were in the AMF Broadway bowling alley in Littleton, Colorado. One of them was 29-year-old father of two, James Springer. A couple months earlier, Springer and his family moved to the area from Utah. Springer was an employee at the bowling alley. Another employee that was closing up that night was Erin Gola. She was a 26-year-old single mother of two. She was passionate about music. Also there that night was 23-year-old Bobby Zajac. Zajac was an accomplished bowler. He had several rings for bowling a perfect game of 300. Many people thought that Zajac was destined to become a pro bowler. That night he was planning on getting a ride home with Springer. At 11.40 p.m., Erin Gola called a friend to pick her up. Ten minutes later, the friend arrived at the bowling alley. They saw a white, middle-aged bald man walking out of the bowling alley. He was wearing a trench coat that was knee-length. He got into a late-model, dark pickup truck and drove off. At 11.55, Gola's friend went into the bowling alley and didn't see anyone around. They made their way to a back room and found the dead bodies of 29-year-old Jane Springer, 26-year-old Aaron Gola, and 23-year-old Bobby Zajac. They had all been shot to death. The police were immediately called. The medical examiner determined that they had most likely been shot to death with a handgun. The police thought that the murders might be connected to an attempted burglary at the bowling alley that happened on January 20, 2007 exactly a week before the triple homicide. The police made the sketch of the bald man seen leaving the bowling alley public. However, no arrests have ever been made in the case. In February 2021, the police said they used genetic genealogy on forensic evidence that was left at the crime scene. But they said they still need more information before they can make an arrest. They are hoping that someone knows something and they'll come forward. To entice someone to contact them, they've increased the reward to $30,000 for information leading to an arrest. The police said that after nearly 20 years, the families of the three victims deserve to know who killed them. Number 2. Jesse Haney, Billy Issam, and Freda Bostick In December 1974, 27-year-old Ernest Ism Jr., who went by the name Billy, and his 26-year-old roommate, Jesse Haney, were boiler makers for a New York company. They were constructing an electrical generating plant south of Sioux City, Iowa. While working in Sioux City, they were renting a house there. Living with the two men was 24-year-old Freda Bostick. Freda was Billy's girlfriend, and she was four months pregnant. In early December, Billy and Jesse didn't show up for work for several days and no one could get a hold of them. So in the morning of December 3rd, 1974, Billy's mother and her neighbor drove over to their home. It was a snowy and frigid day. When they arrived, the house was dark and quiet. They made their way into the house and made a horrifying discovery. Lying face down partially in the dining room and the adjoining living room was the dead body of 24-year-old Freda Bostick. She was only wearing a robe. She had been shot once in the back. In the living room was the dead body of 26-year-old Jesse Haney. He was fully clothed and wearing his winter jacket. He had been shot once in the back and once behind the left ear. 27-year-old Billy Issam Jr. was in the bedroom. He was naked on a mattress. He had been shot three times in the back and twice in the head. The murder weapon was a 380 caliber semi-automatic handgun and they were shot at close range. The last time the trio was seen alive was on the night of November 30th, 1974, about three days before they were found dead. People they knew from a bar came back to their house to party. On December 1st, Billy and Freda were supposed to go to Billy's father's home for dinner. 
but they didn't show up. The police believe that they were killed early on the morning of December 1st, sometime after the party. The police had plenty of potential motives as to why the trio was killed. Just a week before the murders, Jesse Haney told his father and brother that he was nervous because he thought someone was following him. He told a friend he had cheated a man in a drug deal. The police thought that the murders had the hallmarks of a drug hit. The three were essentially executed methodically, which suggested the work of a professional. It also appeared that Billy and Jesse seemed to be expecting problems. They were always armed. For example, Jesse carried a 357 caliber revolver in his lunchbox. Another theory regarding motive is that they were killed because of their job. They were apparently whipping up anti-union sentiments which was making several co-workers angry. The police learned that a man who worked with Jesse and Billy abruptly quit on the day it's believed they were murdered. Then, hours before the bodies were found, he and his girlfriend left the state. The police tracked them to Carlsbad, New Mexico. They were given polygraph exams and it appeared that they knew nothing about the murders. One problem with investigating the murders is that the trio only arrived in Sioux City about a month before they were killed. No one knows where they were in the six weeks before arriving in the city. The police speculated that they were possibly hiding out. Apparently, before coming to Sioux City, Fred had been involved in some type of credit card scam. The police tried to see if the credit card scams led to their murders, but they did not find any valuable leads. The police also tracked down Jesse's girlfriend. She had been with the group just days before the murders, but she left to go to Colorado to take care of some personal business and then she was going to return to Sioux City. She was interviewed by the police and she said she knew nothing about the murders. The lead investigator on the case said that he never believed her, but he never got any other information from her. Another tip that came in was that Jesse had testified in federal court against a drug kingpin. Unfortunately, with so many theories and so little evidence, the police were never able to make an arrest in the case. After 47 years, the case is considered colder than the day their bodies were found. Number 1. The Mars Hill Murders Mars Hills is a small town in eastern Alabama, not far from the Georgia state line. According to the 1980 census, in 1980, it was only home to about 150 people. This included five of the Roberts siblings. All five siblings were elderly and they lived together. They were 79-year-old Columbus, 77-year-old Maybell, 72-year-old Mac, 67-year-old Verlin, and 63-year-old Floyd. They lived in a farmhouse on a quiet, dead-end road. Two other people owned property on the road. On one of the properties, cockfights were held on the weekends. The siblings did not approve of the cockfights, but they did nothing about them. On January 3, 1980, Berlin drove about 18 miles to Cedartown, Georgia to run some errands. She returned home that afternoon. Verlin went into the kitchen and discovered it had been ransacked. In the oven, there were fried sweet potatoes from lunch. The siblings usually put leftovers in the oven to cool down before putting them in the fridge. Verlin went into the living room and found the dead bodies of her sisters, 77-year-old Maybell and 63-year-old Floyd. They had been shot to death. When they were murdered, Maybell was doing some sewing. A thimble was still on her thumb. Berlin went into a bedroom and found her eldest brother, 79-year-old Columbus. At the time, Columbus was dying of cancer and he was bedridden. He had been shot twice and it was clear he was dead. In another bedroom was 72-year-old Mac Roberts. He had been shot five times. He was alive, but not conscious. Berlin tried to use the phone, but it didn't work. 
She drove to a neighbor's home and the police were called. Mac was rushed to the hospital. Sadly, he died six days later without regaining consciousness. Berlin never lived another day in the house, but she did go back to the crime scene. She noted that guns they kept in the house were untouched. About $1,500 had been stolen, but the killer or killers missed about $800 that was around the house. A large trunk and his key were also missing. Berlin said that if they kept money in the house, it was stored in the trunk. But she said that they kept most of their money in the bank. The police concluded that the motive behind the murders was a robbery. There were rumors that the siblings kept $40,000 hidden in the house. The medical examiner determined that three weapons were used in the murders. Columbus was killed by two blasts from a 12-gauge shotgun. A special casing was found on the floor of his room. Mac Roberts was killed with a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver and the two women were shot to death with a 380 caliber AMT pistol. So the police thought that more than one person committed the mass murder. But as to who they might be was a mystery. They had over 100 suspects. It turned out that several people thought Red planned to rob the siblings. They admitted as much to the investigators but they didn't find anyone who actually went through with the robbery. In December 1982, nearly two years after the murders, the missing trunk was found by two deer hunters in a rural area. The trunk provided no clue as to who killed the siblings. Another year went by and then there was an odd twist in the case. In June 1983, Obert Heath, a deputy U.S. Marshal, was at a birthday party for a family member. Albert had grown up in Cleveland County, which is where Mars Hill is located. At the party, people were talking about a gun that his brother, Charles Heath, kept in his truck. Charles was a long-haul trucker. The gun was a sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun. Albert asked to see the gun, and Charles gave it to him. Shotguns with sawed off barrels shorter than 18 inches were illegal and Charles's shotgun barrel was shorter than 18 inches. So Olberg confiscated the gun. At the time he was aware of the murders of the Roberts but he didn't know all the details since he didn't work on the investigation. Nearly two years went by and then two of Olberg's nephews, Bill Heat and Jerry Heat, were arrested for arson. Both had criminal records. Bill was Charles' son, and Jerry was the son of another of Albert's brothers, Lawrence. When they were arrested, Jerry had a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson on him. A few months after they were arrested, Charles contacted Albert. Charles said he was told he should have gotten rid of the shotgun because it might be connected to the murders of the Roberts. Albert decided to get the shotgun and the revolver and take it to the forensic lab. A ballistic expert said that the spent shell casing found on Columbus Roberts' bedroom floor came from the shotgun. Also, the revolver fired the bullets that killed Mac Roberts. So the investigators were excited because they had found two of the three murder weapons, but they had a problem. They had no proof as to who fired the deadly shots. The police searched Charles Heath's home and they found a shotgun that was in the process of being sawed off. The police determined that the gun had been stolen from a home in 1984. It was then given to Bill Heath. In 1987, because Bill was a prior offender, he was sentenced to 20 years for possession of the shotgun. In 1988, Jerry was given two life sentences for helping Bill get the shotgun and for perjury about lying about the gun. But he appealed and he was released after serving just five years. It's unknown what happened to Bill Heat. What is known is that he was never charged with the murders of the four robbers. In fact, no one has ever been charged with their murders. 
Many people believe that Bill and Jerry Heed, at the very least, know who committed the murders. Other people believe that someone related to the cockfights committed the murders. But no evidence has ever been found to prove who did the shooting. After 42 years, the case is considered cold and it is largely forgotten. Berlin Roberts, who wasn't at home at the time of the mass murder, always wanted to see the killer or killers brought to justice. She died over 26 years after the massacre in February 2006. She was 93 years old. She was buried in the same cemetery as her four siblings. Number 3. Jennifer San Marco Jennifer San Marco was born in December 1961 in Brooklyn, New York. She was described as shy and she mostly kept to herself, but she did play with other children on occasion. She attended both Brooklyn College and Rutgers University, but she didn't graduate from either. In 1989, San Marco moved to the West Coast. San Marco usually didn't stay at one job for very long. For a while, she was a correctional officer at Chuckawalla Valley State Prison in Blythe, California. Then she got a job as a police dispatcher in Santa Barbara, California. In 1997, she landed a job sorting mail at the U.S. Postal Department's Mail Distribution Center in Goleta, California. For the first time, she settled into her job. She bought a condo in Santa Barbara, not far from her workplace. She generally kept to herself, but she would join in conversations with co-workers when opportunities arose. Around 2001, San Marco's co-workers noticed a change in her personality. She became withdrawn, irritable, and she would talk to herself. One day, she made a disturbing comment to a co-worker. The co-worker reported the comment and San Marco was told to come to the manager's office. She refused and then caused a scene. The police were called and San Marco was taken into custody. She was held for 72 hours for a psychiatric evaluation. Afterward, San Marco was allowed to return to work, but she had to keep away from her co-worker. Jennifer San Marco remained at the distribution center for two more years. Then in June 2003, she was forced to retire for medical reasons. A month later, she sold her condo. She told several people she was going to visit her sister who lived back east. She then drove away from Galita in her car. Her car broke down near Grants, New Mexico, so she decided to stay there. It wasn't long before her neighbors and Grants started to notice her strange behavior. This included talking to herself and getting down on her knees to pray in the middle of the road. One time she was pulled over by the police while driving her car. She was half naked in the car. One day, San Marco walked into the Milan Village Administrator's office. She said she wanted a business license. She planned on starting a paper called The Racist Press. She wanted to use the paper to publish her bizarre conspiracy theories. For example, she believed that the government could control people and force them to kill other people. She was ultimately denied the business license. In August 2005, San Marco went to a pawn shop and despite having a history of mental illness, she purchased a 9mm handgun. On January 30th, 2006, 44-year-old Jennifer San Marco was in Santa Barbara. She went to her old condo where she confronted her former neighbor, 54-year-old Beverly Graham. They had previously shared a wall. While San Marco lived there, the two women had feuded. Graham was often annoyed when San Marco loudly ranted and raved. San Marco shot her former neighbor several times. She then got back into her pickup truck and drove to Goleta. She managed to get into the parking lot of the distribution center where she used to work by following another vehicle through the entrance gate. She then found an employee and at gunpoint, 
She made him hand over his ID badge. The employee then ran off. San Marco used the badge to get into the building. It is believed that she first shot 37-year-old Z Fairchild, 28-year-old Malika Higgins, and 42-year-old Nicola Grant. Several employees were in the break room and they heard the gunshots. They stepped out of the break room and San Marco smiled as she walked by them. San Marco then walked to her old desk where 44-year-old Charlotte Colton was working. She shot the mother of three in the head. She then walked down the aisles and murdered 42-year-old Guadalupe Shorts and 57-year-old Dexter Shannon. Then 44-year-old Jennifer San Marco shot herself in the head. Every person that San Marco shot died. Her rampage left eight people dead, including herself. Beverly Graham's body was not found until the next day. No one is sure why San Marco killed the people that she did. But based on papers found at her home, San Marco believed that she was the target of a conspiracy theory because of her employment at the mail sorting facility. The real mass murder shocked the people of Santa Barbara and Goleta. Many people knew that Jennifer San Marco had a mental health condition, but no one thought she would ever hurt anyone. Number 2. Catherine Shock Catherine Dempsey was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1894. After high school, Catherine attended nursing school in Dunkirk, New York. In nursing school, she was engaged to another man, but then she met Donald D. Shock and she fell in love with him. They got married in 1917, but the marriage didn't last and they were divorced three years later. However, they got back together four years later and remarried. In 1928, Catherine gave birth to a son, James. Donald and Catherine's second attempt at marriage was not more successful than their first. They divorced again in 1931. After that, Catherine went back into nursing. She and James lived with her sister, Ruth Hughes, in Dunkirk, New York. Ruth and her husband were separated, and Ruth helped Catherine take care of James. Then, tragically, James died from an illness in November 1934. He was just seven years old. Catherine was devastated by the loss of her only son. As Christmas approached, she understandably became more depressed. Despite Catherine's unbelievable grief, she planned on spending Christmas with her brother, Walter Dempsey, his wife, Clara, and their four sons. They lived in Perrysville, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. A week before Christmas, Catherine traveled from her home in Dunkirk to Buffalo, New York. She bought some gifts for her family. She also bought a revolver. On December 23rd, Catherine took a cab 200 miles from Dunkirk to Perrysville. The cab driver refused to take a tip and told Catherine that he would call her if he ever needed a nurse. Catherine told him she wouldn't be around anymore. Catherine walked into her brother's family's home with an armful of gifts. They enjoyed the afternoon and evening together. In the early morning hours of Christmas Eve, 38-year-old Catherine Shock picked up the revolver she had purchased a week earlier. She went into the master bedroom and shot her 42-year-old brother, Walter. The gunshot woke up Clara and she tried to run. Catherine managed to shoot her in the side of the head. Catherine then went into the bedrooms of her nephews, 12-year-old Robert, 10-year-old Walter Jr., 8-year-old Thomas, and David, who was 15 months old. She shot all four of her nephews. Despite being shot in the head, Clara managed to make it out of the house and started screaming for help. One of their neighbors heard her and took Clara to a nearby doctor's office. He then returned to the family's home. Everyone else in the house was dead. This included 38-year-old Catherine Shock. She was found dead at the foot of her brother's bed. 
It was determined she died by suicide by drinking cyanide. The police found four handwritten notes on the dining room table. In all the notes, Catherine explained that she was devastated by the loss of her son and she couldn't go on with her life. But she doesn't explain why she chose to kill her brother and his family. The police in Dunkirk went to the home Catherine shared with her 37-year-old sister, Ruth Hughes. No one answered the door, so officers forced their way inside. In the home, they found Ruth's dead body. She had been shot to death. The medical examiner thought she had been dead at least two days. That meant Catherine killed her sister and then went to her brother's home. This brought Catherine Shock's body count to seven, including herself. Catherine claimed she committed the mass murder because she was devastated by the loss of her only son. The tragically ironic aspect of the story was that there was a lone survivor of the mass murder. That was Clara, Walter's wife and the mother of Robert, Walter Jr., Thomas, and David. She had to live with the loss of her entire family. Number 1. LaFonda Foster and Tina Powell LaFonda Faye Foster and Tina Marie Powell met in the mid-1980s when they were both in their 20s and living in Lexington, Kentucky. They eventually started dating. The two women had a history of drug and alcohol addiction. Foster was also a sex worker. On April 23, 1986, 27-year-old Powell and 22-year-old Foster partied through much of the day. That evening, they went looking for more drugs and alcohol. They went to the apartment of 73-year-old Carlos Kearns and his 45-year-old wife, Virginia Kearns. The couple had a live-in housekeeper, 59-year-old Trudy Harrell. Foster and Powell were friends with Virginia. Virginia convinced Carlos to give them a check for $25. Carlos was semi-disabled and he couldn't drive to the bank. Virginia was very drunk, so she couldn't drive either. So Powell, Virginia and Harold went and got Carlos' car. While they were out, 47-year-old Roger Keane and 52-year-old Theodore Sweet arrived at the Kearns' apartment. Foster, Carlos, Keen, and Sweet then went out to the car. Foster drove to a bait shop where the manager cashed the check. Then they went to the home of a man named Lester Lutterall. Lutterall got into a fight with Foster and Powell. Foster was armed with a 22 caliber handgun and she fired a shot through one of Lutterall's windows. Then they drove off. No one was hit by the bullet. Foster then drove to a field and everyone was ordered out of the car. In the field, 73-year-old Carlos Kearns, 45-year-old Virginia Kearns, and 59-year-old Trudy Harrell were all stabbed and shot. The Kearnses were not fatally injured. The Kearnses and Keen and Sweet, who were unharmed, were ordered to get back into the car. Harrell had been stabbed five times in the face and the chest and her throat had been slit. She had also been shot in the back of the head. Powell then ran over her with the car and her body was dragged 225 feet into a nearby parking lot. Then they drove to a paint store and parked the car behind it. Virginia Kearns was pulled out of the car. She was stabbed some more and her throat was slit. In total, she was stabbed 16 times in the neck area. Amazingly, the stabs and the gunshot wound didn't kill her. Powell then ran over her, and this is what finally killed her. Foster and Powell then drove around with the three men for a while. Then they drove to another field and forced them to get out of the car. 47-year-old Roger Keane was shot three times in the head. 52-year-old Theodore Sweet was shot in both ears. Carlos Kearns, who was 73 years old, was shot twice in the head. All the men's throats were slit as well. Afterward, the car was driven over them, but became stuck on Keane. While he was pinned under the car, the car was set on fire. LaFonda Foster and Tina Powell 
then walked to a nearby hospital. Hal went to call a cab from a payphone, and Foster went to the washroom, where she washed some of the blood off. A nurse noticed that both women were splattered with blood, so she called the police. Officers happened to be in the hospital on an unrelated matter. They came and questioned the women. When they did, the officers could smell alcohol on them. Then Foster and Powell became belligerent, so they were arrested. At the jail, Foster managed to trade her bloodstained pants with another inmate's pants. The next day, all five bodies were found. That same day, the pants that Foster was wearing when she committed the murders were retrieved, and in the pockets were 22 caliber bullets. Soon, the two women were linked to all five murders. One thing that connected all the murders was that all the victims were shot with the same 22 caliber handgun. Several people saw Powell and Foster with a handgun on the night of the murders. Also, the victims had been stabbed and cut with the same knife. Earlier that night, Powell had tried to sell the knife to a group of people. While in jail, Foster confessed to the murders to another inmate. They said they wanted to kill the women because they were bitches. Then they had to kill the men because they had seen too much. Foster talked about laughing when they committed the murders. She also said she was as good of a call leader as Charles Manson. Tina Powell and LaFonda Foster went to trial in February 1987. Powell's lawyer said that Powell was a battered victim of Foster. The lawyer claimed that Powell only participated in the murders because she feared her abusive partner would kill her if she didn't. Foster's lawyer said that Foster was so wasted that she had no idea what was going on. The trial lasted about three weeks, and in over three days, the jury deliberated for 21 hours. They were both found guilty of all five murders. Tina Powell was sentenced to five life sentences. She was able to apply for parole after 25 years. LaFonda Foster was sentenced to death. She was only the second woman in the 20th century to be sentenced to death in Kentucky. The first woman was Laverne O'Brien, who was convicted in 1980 of poisoning two of her husbands. O'Brien's death sentence was commuted to life in prison in 1980. LaFonda Foster's date with the electric chair was supposed to be April 22, 1988. But her lawyers appealed and her execution date was pushed back. The appeal argued that Foster and Powell should have been tried separately. In December 1991, the Kentucky Supreme Court quashed her death sentence and she was ordered to have a new sentencing hearing. For years, there was a legal battle regarding the sentencing hearing. In 1996, Foster said she was sick of being in jail 23 hours a day alone and she was ready to die. Another three years went by, then in January 1999, nearly seven years after her death sentence was reversed. Foster agreed to a plea deal. She accepted life in prison without the chance of parole. At the time of this video, 63-year-old Tina Powell is serving her sentence at the Kentucky Correctional Institution for Women in Shelby County, Kentucky. She was first eligible to apply for parole in April 2011. It was deferred for 10 years. She was able to apply again in April 2021. Her parole was denied and was ordered she would have to serve out the rest of her sentence in prison. LaFonda Foster is 58 years old and she is serving her sentence at the same prison. Both women will most likely die in prison. Thank you so much for watching today's video. And now, here's a short clip from our latest paranormally listed video. Three Portals to Hell Number 1. Bobby Mackey's Music World, Kentucky, USA Bobby Mackey's Music World is a nightclub in Wilder, Kentucky that also offers ghost tours. The club has a dark history with links to the occult. 
In the 1800s, the building was used as a slaughterhouse. In the late 1800s, the site attracted satanic worshippers who met in the abandoned building once the slaughterhouse was shut down. In the 1930s and 40s, the building was a casino. Eventually, the owner was forced out by the mob. New owners took over and were repeatedly arrested on gambling charges during the 1950s. Then it became a Hard Rock Cafe. When the Hard Rock Cafe closed in January 1978 after several people were shot dead on the site. Bobby Mackey is a country music singer and he had no desire to own a nightclub. But then he fell in love with the two-story clapboard building. He had never been in the building before but he felt deja vu when he entered it. You can find a link to the rest of the video on the screen now. There is also a link to the channel in the description box below this video. Thanks again for watching.